you know, Deacon Tom is going to start. Some of you, most of you here know him. And uh, I, oh, I need to move over here. I know him well. He is a very, very gifted dude. I tease him. I give him a bad time. We were teasing when, when uh, we were in here at the beginning. Stella was kind of questioning some of the things she said, I, and I tried to let her know. Sometimes, you know, if you're in a conversation with Deacon Tom and he ever says this to you, if you're having a discussion, and if he ever says, um, I don't disagree, what that means with him is, I disagree. That's what it means with him, okay? Now, that may sound funny, but I know you well enough to know, like in business, all what he tries to do with people is keep the conversation moving. Don't make people defensive. And it's worked for him well in business. He and I have approached finances in a completely, really different, well, in many ways the same, but many ways differently. You're going to get different perspectives here from two very different people, uh, but our our end result has been really, really similar. So thank you for coming. Deacon Tom is going to start. I'll pick it up after he runs out of a little bit of steam. So, all right, and let's let's go ahead and stand, and we'll turn around and pray with our icons. I think I'm the ranking clergy for the moment. So, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Lord, we ask for your blessing. We thank you for your abundant provision for all of us, and especially this day, we ask for help with our financial life, that you would help us to be good stewards of all you've given us, that we can make you happy with what we've done, and that we can turn and help others. We ask this in your blessed name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome, welcome. All right, well, as, as Bruce said, we, uh, you know, we know it's a, it's a Saturday, and that's a sacrifice for everybody. Um, I, I think and believe you're all going to be really glad you made time to do this. This is, uh, you know, we're, this is going to give you a, a leg up because um, people, people often don't, you know, they, they just don't think about things like their financial life. And especially, you know, we've got to, well, I was going to say also, I'm, I'm so pleased to see so many young people here. I mean, we got Tony, you know, we got Rudy here. We got all these young folks. No, this this is really neat. I'm, and Bruce brought some of his grandchildren here. And one thing we can do, one thing that's beautiful about financial management is if we, if you start at a young age, and there's two factors that can go into that. Because one is you have just time to let money grow and run. And as we'll we'll talk later today, you'll see how much of a difference that can make. And the second thing is, as a young person, if you avoid making poor financial decisions, and again, we will give some specific examples of those, and you will see how that can really work against you, and you know the, the positive ones will be super, super helpful. So, okay, so to get started here, Bruce gave a little brief intro. Why should you listen to Deacon Tom? I'm, I'm clergy. What, what do clergy, you know, clergy are poor, right? They, they don't know anything about money, so um, what is what? What can uh, you know about me that might help? Well, uh, Bruce Bruce likes to tease me that that uh, I I smile a lot. In fact, it was funny. Uh, where's Diane Reagan? Okay, so yesterday we had a last night we had a church service, and Father Mike says uh, after the service he says, you know, somebody was visiting, and they said, who's that priest that smiles all the time? And you know, so. I, I have this reputation, but so Bruce says, hey, he's Deacon Tom, nice guy. But I do have a separate life, independent of my work here in the church. And, and at, at the church, I am a volunteer deacon. I, I have a daytime job. I'm a civil engineer. And I, my work life, I've been a victim of what is called Peter's Principle. Does anybody, anybody know in the business world what Peter's Principle is? 
Nobody. Come on, somebody. Peter's principal? Rudy. Yeah, might not be the right one. Someone kind of gets promoted up to the point where they kind of stop with their skill set. And then have That's that's pretty good. That's that's pretty good. What it was a guy named Peters, and what he said is that if you're halfway good at a job, you will get promoted. And that what happens is you keep getting promoted and promoted until eventually you're completely unqualified to do the job you're doing. Like, for example, as an engineer, you know, you go to engineering school and they teach you how to design pipes and circuits and stuff. And then if you're a good engineer, they say, well, we're going to make you a manager. And you have no management training. So now one thing we're going to do today, I think, I think we are prepping for this. We've told people we're going to hand out some cash. Now, a few, when we did this a few years ago, we were handing out $1 bills, and now there's, there's been a little bit of inflation since then. So, so we're now, we've, we've upped it to $2. So Rudy, Rudy gave an answer. So Rudy, good job, Peter's principal. So I, I ended up, Peter's principal worked on me, and I ended up um, working for a public company as a senior exec. I ran a 2,000-person division with 40 offices around the US and Canada. I was on a plane two to three days a week, living in hotel rooms. And uh, it wasn't real fun, so eventually I, I decided to start my own company. And I'm glad I did that. But I've, I've also done, uh, I've made some good decisions and bad decisions. I am 61 years old. I can look back and say, you know, could have done differently on that. Uh, in fact, a, a quick funny one. Wendy was looking up the other day, the first house we bought in 1988, we paid we paid 147. Nobody choke. That was a long time ago. We paid 147 for a little house uh, over by Beach Boulevard in the 405. Uh, we sold it about 10 years later for about 195. Wendy looked it up uh, this past week on on Zillow. It's it's currently valued at over a million dollars. You know, <laughs> and so I'm like, I could have kept that house, and had a million dollar house paid for that was probably people paying 3000 a month in rent. So, so that was not one of my better decisions to sell that house. So, um, but I've made a few decent ones through the years. Um, as I said, I've, I've made some money, lost some money, done, done some investing through the years and some have worked out well, some not. And last thing, I'm a little bit odd. Uh, Bruce, Bruce, we're pretty good friends. Sometimes we travel together and he likes to tease me. Um, the first time we did this seminar, we were prepping for it, and he said, "He said, Deacon Tom, you know, you're you're such a good saver. I bet you, I bet you really enjoy spending money. You know, when you get around to it." And I said, "You know, Bruce, I actually really don't. I I actually I I don't enjoy spending money. Money is not a huge driver for me. Um, I am very competitive, and I." I, the best I can come up with is maybe money's kind of a way of keeping score. But, you know, my big dream in life is not to have a $10,000 Rolex watch or, a, you know, four homes or anything. Um, so anyway, and uh, Wendy and I, I'm, I'm grateful. My wife, uh, she, she and I both do enjoy giving money away, which is, which is a, nice, a nice thing. I'm glad we're on the same page. Okay, what we're going to do today, give you a quick overview. We're going we're gonna to go through some um, basics of money. Our, our education system, it is so, it, it's so interesting. Um, I think starting about the time I was in high school, which, which uh, was started in 1976, I think, you know, there, there started to be this really big push. Everybody go to college, go to college, go to college. And we, we make kids do this. And then, and then we have kids spend 50, 100, $200,000 going to college. And we don't teach them basics of money. And you know they don't know they're 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 going into all this debt and they're going to end up with a thirty or forty thousand dollar a year job. So we're going to talk a little about money. We're going to give you some takeaways. I, I Bruce and I like to call them little pearls of wisdom that uh, are are good are good things. You know sometimes if uh, if you make stuff too complicated, people don't stick with it. And if if just a lot of times it's just you know little things like uh, you know. Love your neighbor as yourself, okay? You know, it's an easy thing. We can remember it. And so we're going to give you some things like that. Um, we're going to talk about budgeting. We're going to talk about spending. Bruce is going to do that. And he's also going to talk about some success stories. We, we, uh, we through the, the few times we've done this, we've had some people come back to us and say, you know, 
that that really helped me. You know, I was able to buy a house or I was able to, you know, do something that that really helped change their financial future. We are going to do a little breakout session. Now, nobody get worried. This is this will be strictly confidential. You you don't have to share your numbers with anybody, but one thing Bruce and I want to do, we want you to walk out of here today with tangible tools that you can start using today and tomorrow. Okay, we, we don't want you just walking out of here and, oh, they gave us a bunch of theory and whatever. Like, no, you need to start on this right away. So we are going to have you spend a little bit of time. We've got some handouts that you can do fill-ins, start looking at your budget, some planning, and that's, that's something really important. We'll make some time for Q&A, and then we're going to we'll take a little break. We'll let you have a little bit of a break. Um, something I'm really excited about is careers, because uh, I, you know, it, like I said, it's 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 been a good thing for me, and especially again, all these young people, I I love to see people make a a really good decision and not just you know gravitate towards something because their parents did it or somebody's pushing them. We you, you need to give a little thought and and give some real practical advice on how you can be more effective at your job and how you can be more valuable and get promoted and that kind of stuff. We'll talk a little bit about investments, just, just a little bit, where Bruce and I, we'd like to be careful giving investment advice because as soon as you start recommending something, um, you know, it's destined to go down and then you feel horrible for telling somebody, you know, giving them an idea what to do. We'll, we'll potentially offer some follow up cuz you know there might be some people that are that are maybe in more of a uh, uh, I don't know crisis uh, maybe they need to be triaged you know the bill collectors are at your door uh, you know bugging you and that can be a real tough thing and so if you know if people need some specific help we will we're, we're happy to do a separate follow up you know in the coming weeks or months and um, we'll do a little more Q&A at the end and the last thing I I'm going to hit before we get into the the details of it here um, my biggest fear, okay, some, some of you know my, my father-in-law who passed away a number of years ago, Father Peter Gilquist, and Father Peter would tell this, this story just, just before Bruce and I did this a number of years ago. He said, he said he had done kind of a similar seminar for the, the parish that he was at in Santa Barbara, and he said, Deacon Tom, I gave, I gave these guys all this investment advice. I gave them names, phone numbers, things they should do. And he said, as far as I can tell, they did nothing. So our biggest fear for both, both Bruce and I is that, you know, you make time to come out here Saturday. Bruce and I put some effort into this and that nothing happens, nothing changes. Now, I can tell looking out here, this is a sharp group of people and I'm pretty confident that's not going to happen. But I, I like to put a little fire under there, so just make sure that doesn't happen. Okay, getting into the details here. Money 101. So buckle your seatbelts. We're going we're gonna to move kind of fast on this stuff. The first thing we, we really need to understand about money, okay? How it works, both, both physically, and I'll, I'll get into some details. Don't worry, it won't be real, you know, calculus, you know, fancy stuff, but I'll get into some basics, but then also probably just or more importantly is emotionally how money deals with us and you know probably all of us with, without even being sold too hard you know money can be a very emotional thing and it's you know it feels kind of like it's mine or uh, you know your maybe your parents didn't teach you well about money maybe you grew up in a in a tough situation where you always had trouble paying the rent and you were maybe you know not even sure where your next meal was coming from it can be a real a tough thing. So we're going to start with a question here. Okay, how, how complicated is money? Do, do most people struggle with money? You know, do you think this is a common, common thing people struggle with? Okay, now let's see. Okay, Brian, I'll pick on you. So Brian, what, what do you think? Is, is money complicated? Okay, but, but... <laughs> I'm going to give you a hint. Is money complicated? It's simple. You know what? You know, Brian, okay. You know what? Just because you gave a, you, because this is a really important thing. Brian's going to get a $20 bill. He's, he, he, he's, he's got the big one. So, 
that's that's an important money honest honestly honestly it really is pretty simple okay and what you need to do you need to remove a mental block i mean again maybe we just have never been taught by our parents maybe our schools didn't teach us and we we've just got to we, we've got to get to a point where we break through and realize it's it's not that complicated at the end of the day and you'll see as we work through this okay uh, speaking of money, who knows what the number one cause of strife in a marriage is? Number one cause? Money. Who said? Spencer? Spencer? Okay, Spencer. I'm going to give you, <laughs> Spencer's getting a, now you're not getting a 20. You're only getting two for that, okay? So, yes, money is the biggest, the biggest cause of, of strife in a marriage. And that's, that's one thing Bruce and I hope, you know, by the end of the day, we're going to, we're going to help everybody avoid that that stress in life. And this, you know, I would encourage you all as we look at this, this, it is a, it is a fight, you know, it's, it's a challenge. And when I say fight, I'm not talking about within a marriage, but, but this, this, our approach to money, we really do need to fight it. I mean, our, our culture, like you think about this, every billboard you drive by, every radio ad, every uh, clickbait that you see on your screen. What's it trying to do? It is trying to separate you from your money, right? I mean, I mean, there's a lot of people that 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 is their job in life is to separate you from your money. And as soon as you understand that that's how the game plays, you can be a more effective player on the field, right? Otherwise, you're just you know standing out there and getting beat up by the waves. So, uh, it is it is a fight, and your your future, your family's future, um, can very well depend on on how well you do in this competition. And I would add, you know, any do we have any churchgoers here today? A, a few, okay. So even as you know, people that uh, are are church folk, um, your spiritual life can very well be tied to this if. If you, if you, you know, your financial life is a mess, you know, usually these things domino all together and your, your relationships struggle, um, you're stressed all the time, and it, and it will absolutely domino into your spiritual life. So this, this is really important. Okay, so what we need to do is start with an honest assessment of where we're all at, okay? So Marho for girls. How is your financial life working for you? I'm, I'm teasing. They're, they're probably not ready. But, I mean, you're, you're not, you guys don't look like you're starving to death. You're doing okay, right? Okay. Your parents feed you? All right. Did they give you an allowance? No, they don't feed you? Did they pay for I see you're wearing braces. Did they pay for your braces? You did not. <laughs> okay. So, we all need to be honest with ourselves. How, are, are you happy? You know, ask yourself, am I happy with where my financial life is? And, you know, one thing I want to stress, money is certainly not a cure-all, right? I mean, we, we all know there's people that are very wealthy that maybe they end up taking their own life or something. You know, money in and of itself will not make you happy, but we also want to make sure we are, are being good stewards of what we have. So, are you happy with where you're at? And, uh, you know, the main thing in, along those lines, we, we want to make sure we're not being victims, you know, because some, some of us, again, whether our, our, in our culture, unfortunately, seems to be more and more moving in that direction where everybody seems to be able to claim a victim status of some kind, right? And, well, my parents didn't teach me or, you know, I'm this or that, so I'm, I'm never going to be able to do okay financially. You've got to take an honest look at yourself, you know, especially those of us here that are Orthodox, you know, we, we're supposed to go inside and look at ourselves and not be looking out for other people to blame, right? So what do I need to do to change my behavior? And that's the next thing we're going to cover for a minute. Okay, we, if, if we're not happy, and, I, and I'm going to say, I, I, would, I won't ask for people to raise hands, but I would bet that the bulk of us would probably say we're not completely happy with where our financial life is at. I mean, honestly, I don't know that I would say that about myself. And it's not like I'm having trouble making my house payment or anything like that. And I've got plenty in 401ks. But 
I don't know that I feel like I've made all the right decisions and you know, have I, have I really planned this thing out and being careful with it? So the, when we talk about motivation, a, an important question is how bad do we want something? And you have to, you have to consider every thing we do is a trade-off, right? I, I, like I, I deal with a business coach that is uh, that I, I have helped me out with my business. And one thing he's been pressing with me is that every time you say yes to something, you're saying no to something else, right? So, you know, if I agree, okay, I agreed to do this seminar. I had to spend time preparing for it, hours and hours. And I'm out here today with you guys, okay? So guess what? I can't be with my wife, my grandkids, can't be at the gym, can't be at the beach. Every, now, I'm, I'm glad to do that, and I'm happy with this trade-off. But, but we do have to be honest. Every, every single decision we make for ourselves, for our finances, is a trade-off. If you say yes to buying the new car, then you're probably saying no to something else. You know, maybe you can't get your braces because your parents bought a new car. You know? So poor girls can have crooked teeth all their life. Okay, every, everything has a trade-off. Now, speaking of motivation, <clears throat> I need a little help here for a minute. What are, what are some things that drive people whether just in general or financially. And I'm not, let's just say, so I don't put anybody feel inhibited answer. It doesn't have to be how you feel. What do you, let's generically, what, what drives people either financially or, you know, just in life to make decisions? Spencer. Either way, either way. Okay, keeping up with the Joneses. You know what? You know what, that's not a bad answer. Well, you're gonna get $2 for that, okay? All right. Any any other any other drivers? Uh, hold, hold on, David. Debt. Debt. Okay, Bruce. Give your grandson a he can get, he can get a two. Okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. Unexpected, like uh, unex excellent, excellent. That's that's a driver. Unexpected. Uh, that's a two bucker. Stella, the young lady in the back. Yes. Fear. Fear, that's a really, you, just give her, just give her a two, but, but that was a good one. Fear. Okay, wait, hold on. Noah, Noah. Oh, jealousy. Okay, very good. Okay, he, he deserves two for that. Let's see. Rudy, were you going to say something? Yeah, power. Power. Okay, yes, yes. Is the money motivating people right now? <laughs> <laughs> did, I, did I see another hand somewhere? Right here. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. Say, I'm sorry. Dream, pff, dreams and interests. Wow, look at you. That's a good one. Oh, hopefully, that's hopefully that's a strong motivator. You know, Rudy, were you the one who said power or no? Okay. You know, so maybe you need to pay more attention to her dreams. Let's say the, the positive one. Okay. <laughs> okay. And on a on a financial side, yeah. I mean, think about it. You know, maybe it's retirement. Uh, maybe it's having a, a home big enough to fit. Like Tony's got three daughters, and I mean, you you girls all have to share bed in one bedroom, right? No, I'm kidding. But but uh, you know, you want a house big enough for your family. Maybe you want to take a nice vacation. Maybe you just like giving money away, and you like uh, helping out people that are in need. That's that's a very worthwhile goal. In fact, I, I would say this: my oldest brother Dan, who's been very successful in business. Um, he is, uh, he's 69. He, he lives in Santa Barbara, lives in a nice house on the hill and, and he could easily retire, but he's told me he keeps working so that he can give to the church and, you know, help out that way. And so, you know, that's for a lot of people that can be an important motivation too. Okay. Let's go on this. It's getting more in the weeds on the, the deeper motivation. Okay. Why, I, 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 I love this thing, okay, we all need a big why, okay? You know, we, I said there's trade-offs, right? And whenever any of us make our decision about what we are going to do, it's we have to have a why, okay? So let's see, uh, Robinson Girls, okay. So when you're going to decide whether, because I know you, you guys are pretty studious, I, when you guys are deciding whether to do your homework or mess around on your phone, you know, I'm assuming you usually choose to do your homework, but, but why, okay, why are you choosing to do your homework versus messing on your phone? 
Okay, what, your parents are going to spank you or something? Or? <laughs> Okay, all right, so she had a few motivations worked in there, right? One of them was a little bit of fear. I actually don't think fear is a bad motivator. Fear in, in business world, fear has been a good motivator for me because I don't ever want to walk into a, a meeting and not be prepared and you know be embarrassed. So, so that's a helpful thing. And then also she had the positive one. She wanted to get a good grade in there. Bruce, give her a couple dollars. She needs a college fund, okay? <laughs> so... You know, think about some of these, these, why we do something. Why do we pray? Why do we go to church? Why do we go to the gym or not? Uh, you know, choose to get involved in some poor behavior or not. You know, what's that? Why do we, why do we fast? You know, it's, it's all these things are trade off and, and, you know, just, uh, of course, with the since Bruce brought up fasting, you know, what's what's our real goal in fasting? Is it is it to beat ourselves up? Is it a negative motivation? I'm hope hopeful somebody will give me the right answer here. Is it Spencer? It, there there you go. Well said. So it, you know the the goal of fasting is not to beat ourselves up and go around all you know, miserable. It's, it's that we want to say no to passion so we can draw closer to God. Okay. All right. I'm going to do a specific exercise here. Who, who knows what a paradigm is? Anybody give me a good Perry, Perry. Yes. I was hoping, I was actually thinking, I thought if nobody raised their hand, I'm going to pick on Perry. Okay, fair enough. Perry, would you would you say, you know, sometimes you're, I know you're, and I'm not being funny, Perry's probably three times smarter than I am, but uh, I, I tend to, just my simple way is that it's kind of like a lens, okay? It's how, how any of us see the world, and I see the world one way, Tony's going to see it slightly different, Granite's going to see it a little bit different, you know, we all have our, our way we look at things. Okay, so... Um, give Perry two dollars. And by the way, Perry's for those who don't know, Perry's parent to the daughter that just answered a question. So he and he's got three daughters that are going to go to college, I think. So he he needs some help. Okay. So here's a quick exercise. Who thinks they could save, you know, and reasonably easy, ten thousand dollars in the next six months? Okay. You you think that's easy? Well, I think I. Okay. All right. That's that's okay. Okay. All right. How how many people think it's easy to save ten thousand dollars in six months? Okay, I'm not not seeing a lot of hands going up. Okay. I I mean honestly, you know, think about it. Even even somebody that's making two hundred thousand dollars a year, you know, if you if you you thought about that in a year, that's ten percent of their income, right? Twenty, you know, ten thousand dollars six months, two times, that's twenty thousand dollars. You know, 20 grand is a big chunk of change, right? So a, an example, and I think, I think where Bruce and I got this example, because a lot of our material we borrowed from Dave Ramsey, who is a, a really good financial guy. He's on the radio and does all kinds of uh, things like this. And so he gave, he gave an example like this that he said, uh, you know, so I'll, I'll pick on, uh, well, I'll pick on Rudy. Okay, because Rudy has three daughters, and he just had a little sweet baby Anastasia born, and she, she had to have heart surgery, okay? And she's only three months old. Okay, so if, if poor Rudy, if we said, we said you know, Rudy, if, if your daughter needs this surgery, and it's going to cost $10,000, and you need it within six months, or she's not going to make it, like... Are, are you going to be able to come up with, and you can't beg and you don't have nice friends from the church that are going to give it to you. So are you going to be able to come up with the $10,000? Saving for $10,000 or drawing from my resources? Let's say, let's say you can't draw from your resources. Okay. Let's say you got to, you got to come up right. with new money. Um, I would hope potentially I could really begin to limit costs and have adequate income to where that's doable. Okay. All right. 
Now, I, I halfway like your answer, okay? Now, if, could you, like, how many hours a week do you think you work? 40. Okay. Could you work more than 40 hours? Could you work 50 hours? Could you work 60 hours? To keep, to keep your daughter alive, could you work 80 hours? 80 hours. To keep your daughter alive. He, he would, okay, he would keep his daughter, I mean, I mean, who in here, you know, 80 hours, honestly, it would be exhausting, but could you suck it up for six months and, you know, you could deliver pizzas or work at Taco Bell or something and come up with $10,000 in six months, right? So the question is, how bad do you want something? And, and so the, the beauty of that thing is, is you know, it, it help, hopefully that little exercise just helps us think a little bit. You know, sometimes we, we get stuck in this rut of, I can, I'm only working 40 hours a week. Now, now, Rudy's got three daughters. I'm not saying I want Rudy to work 80 hours a week and never see his wife and kids again. Okay, again, money is not a cure-all. But, but can we make trade-off decisions? And Rudy did bring up one. Can he limit costs? Okay, yeah, maybe, maybe he and his wife decide, okay, we're not going to go out to dinner. We're going to eat, you know, beans and rice for the next six months because we're going to just cut. We're not going to go on vacation, all that stuff. But the, the main thing is we have to just expand our mind a little bit and realize, you know, what, what it is. We have to retool our thinking and go, okay, do I, am I really stuck in this lane? It, it, is, is there a bigger world out there than, than me with my little blinders on here? Okay. so. Again, along with this same exercise, the issue is what are our priorities? So if, if somebody has a life-threatening illness, for example, in their family, that's probably going to go up to DEFCON 5. David, you're going to, well, no, you said you're not going to be in the military. Any, any military people? Anybody was from military? Okay. I mean, we all hopefully know what DEFCON 5, right? You know, defense condition 5, that's like nuclear war is about to happen. China is going to launch missiles. You know, Putin's on our shores ready to invade. So, you know, if, if your family's got a serious health issue, that is going to become DEFCON 5. And your European vacation or your retirement or no, nothing else matters at that point, right? So that's going to become your ultimate, you know, critical priority. And along with that, think about, think about, and, and let, really, let's, I'm, I'm not going to pick on you, and we all need to help answer this question, but, but you know, think about our standard of living. Okay, so all of us, uh, Bruce, is the air on, by the way? Okay, all right. The, you know, our standard of living, all of us choose, um, okay, I'll pick on random people. Armin, did somebody make you buy the particular car you've chosen to buy? Nobody did. No. Okay, David, my son in the back there, did somebody tell you where you had to move the place that you're currently living in? Okay, all right. Uh, Candace. Did somebody tell you what particular business you and your husband chose to get into? No. Okay. Uh, let's see. Stella. Okay. Does somebody tell you? Well, you're Greek. This could be a odd one. No one did somebody? Me. Did somebody tell you what you had to eat for dinner? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Okay. Even something as simple as our dinner, right? It's all our choice at the end of the day, right? And so, so again, I, I, I want to focus on that for just a minute because. Again, we, we need to retool the way we think about this because the clothes I choose to buy, the, you know, again, do you want, look, I'm not even wearing a watch, okay? So do you choose to buy a, a cheapy $50 watch or do you buy a $10,000 Rolex, okay? We all, what's that? It takes, get, get, Bruce, give him, ten, give him $2. He deserves that. <laughs> but but that's, that's an important, that's an important thing. And... And it's what I want us to just take away from this, this slide is it's at the end of the day, it's our choice. And again, I'm, I'm going to, you know, I see this whole cadre of, of young, well, there's young people everywhere, but, but, you know, as you guys grow up and, you know, cause you're going to start, I know we got a lot of people on the cusp of college age in here, like don't buy into the advertising thing. I mean, I, I remember when I got out of college, a lot, of, a lot of my college mates, the first thing they did was go out and buy a new car. Like, cool. I, got, I mean, when I was getting out of college, 
$25,000 a year was a good salary. Okay, that's $12 an hour. You know, that's even less than minimum wage. Saying that was for a, a guy with an engineering degree. And then people were going out and buying, you know, Camaros and stuff, you know, because they were single. I, I was already married and had a kid by then. But, but uh, you know, like, really, is that, the, is that your best choice? So I'm going to challenge your thinking. Don't, you know, Bruce, Bruce is going to cover some of this spending. We're not going to tell you how to spend your money, but we just want you to think about it because all these decisions have, have a, uh, an impact. Okay. All right. So we're going to quickly go through just a few uh, kind of sayings that, that uh, you know, some of us, again, it will help challenge our way of thinking. So back to our standard of living, okay, uh, Joby, do you, do you truly deserve to have a nice house? I mean, I'm not saying do you want a nice house. I'm not saying if you have a nice house. Do you deserve? It, is it your right to have a nice house? Do you deserve it? Okay, you, you don't. You don't, right? Um, do you deserve to have straight teeth? You... <laughs> what a beautiful smile. I love it. Bruce, give her $2 just for having a good smile. Okay, here, the truth is, the truth is, people do what they want. Okay, again, what we choose to wear, what kind of car we drive, how much we go out to dinner or not. Um, and so at the end of the day, what do we deserve? We deserve nothing, right? I mean, we, we rely on God's grace for everything. And, you know, every breath we take, um, you know, it, everything we rely on God. We don't deserve it. We accept it with grace and we're thankful for it. So that's an important one. We don't deserve stuff. Okay, this one, this one is a kind of a hot button for me. I don't know how big of a deal car, cars are. You know, I, I know even my own kids didn't necessarily get driver's license real early on, but, but this, this one still can be a, cars are a, you know, typically the second biggest expense after where you choose to live. So this is a picture of across the street from my house. Um, one of my neighbors, has a, a beautiful Maserati Q4, and that's an $85,000 car. The guy is, uh, I, I looked it up, the guy, he, he's a nice kid. I think he's, he's somewhere in the 20, 22 years old range. And I mean, it's so new, it still has the paper license plate on the back. But uh, are you raising your hand, Perry, or just stretching? Okay, <clears throat> you're not loving that car. <clears throat> you, don't, you, don't, you don't want that car. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> We're going to, okay, remember that picture and the 85,000. We're going to talk more about that in a few minutes. Okay, so when, 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 you look at a, when you look at that car, okay, when you see, you know, what, what do you see? You see, a, you know, something beautiful. Um, I, what's that? Prestige, prestige, okay. Um, what, what I, who knows what an asset is? Anybody? Uh, go ahead. What's an asset? Okay. Uh, Nadia, you want to chime in? Give him $2. Nadia, chime in. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. Fair. Okay. That, both those answers are true. Now, but what I see when I look at that fancy car, I see a depreciating asset. What, who knows what a depreciating asset is? Uh, okay. Ezra. Something that goes down in value over time. So I, I remember I, I remember talking to a young young guy one time. He was actually uh, years ago used to go to this church and a nice guy. But he was he got it into his head. He was renting, and he's like, I just need to have an asset. I need to buy a car so I have an asset. It's like no, an, it, it, that is not going to go up in value. It's going to go down. <coughs> so, and then what happens? Of course. With, with your $85,000 car? I mean, do you, do you worry about getting door dings? You know, if you have a beater car, you know, I mean, nobody wants a door ding when you come out of the grocery store, but you got an $85,000 car, you come out and you got a door ding, you're pretty bummed and you're probably gonna be pretty bummed for a while, okay? And of course, things like you're gonna pay way more insurance, way more registration and, uh, Eventually, that new car smell actually does wear off, and then it's just a regular old, you know, mode of transportation. So, 
again, trying to help people challenge their way of thinking. You know, don't make those knee-jerk decisions. Don't make emotional decisions. Really think about it. Okay, money is evil. We got to, again, I'm, I remember a lot of people raised their hand. We have a lot of church going folks here. This is a common one. Uh, and I personally would say I think it can be a little bit of an excuse, maybe even a cop-out for why people don't uh, do a good job managing their money or, or just, you know, be a little bit even irresponsible. I say money is, money is not evil because does the Bible say money is evil? Any church going, does it? Uh, Colleen Allen. The love of money. It is not money itself. And I, I brought a little prop in here. So th this, this is a brick. And I, a, a brick is, is neither good nor bad. Okay, a brick can build a hospital. It can build a church, uh, a school. It can do a lot of good things, right? Or a brick can break a window or hurt somebody. Okay, the brick doesn't care. It's, it's neutral. Okay, money is the same way. Money is neutral, and it is what we call amoral. It is, it is neither good nor bad. We don't want to get sucked into the love of money. I've said a number of times that uh, you know, money is not a cure-all, but we want to be good stewards. Okay, all right. I can't afford to give. I'm just going to hit two quick slides on this. I, I did a homily on this this past week for those that, that go to St. Barnabas, and so I don't want to hit this too hard, but... Um, I, I like to say that, uh, you know, you can't afford not to give. And again, I, I'm stealing this from my father-in-law, Father Peter Gilquist, the blessed memory. You know, he had a great saying. He would say, you know, Deacon Tom, we want people to be caregivers, not care receivers. And, and I think that's a, good, that's a good goal in life. You know, again, that's part of what God calls us to about being good stewards. You know, hopefully at the end of our life, we're not you know, somebody has to take care of us. Hopefully we've done enough that actually we're able to help other people. I mean, that'd be, that's really where we want to be. And the, the, the one thing I would say about that I can't afford not, or I can't afford to give, I, I have talked to many Christian people, some that even make high incomes, like two to $300,000 a year, that don't give or give very little, and they they are convinced that they can't afford to give. And I would circle back to what I said a few minutes ago about our, our, um, what we choose with our standard of living. What house or apartment, what car, what clothes, what vacations, all these things feed into our budget. And so at some point, if you go, you know, well, I just can't afford to give. Well, I would say, mm, maybe it's more the choices you've made. And again, what are your priorities in life, okay? All right, um, only rich people uh, can save, okay? And the more important thing to remember, and, and Bruce is going to hit on this a little bit in just a few minutes, it's not what you make, it's what you keep, okay? Because you can, there are people, there are doctors and lawyers making three, four, five hundred thousand dollars a year that are functionally broke because every time they make a little more money, they raise their standard of living. They buy the Maserati. They buy the beach house. They go the expensive vacation, the diamond tennis bracelets. And they're seriously, they live paycheck to paycheck. And then when there's any kind of hiccup, all of a sudden, you know, they're having bill collectors call them. So we need to avoid that having stuffitis or affluenza where we just start gathering more, more stuff. Okay, this is, this is a fun one. The lotto is my retirement plan. <clears throat> Okay, and I'm gonna in a few minutes I'm gonna hit a couple quick slides on this, but if we if we do a good job with our money management, it, we have a guaranteed win over a guaranteed loss, and I'll, I'll show some slides on that that are that are kind of fun. With the lotto, I know we've all heard the stats about you know you're more likely to get bit by a shark or you know in fact I saw an interesting stat it said you're three to ten times more likely to be killed in a car wreck on the way to buy a lotto ticket than, than winning the lottery. And by the way, I would just say on a personal level, I, I think I've spent, maybe my entire life, I've spent about $30 on lotto tickets. And you know, uh, usually people that manage their money halfway well don't buy lotto tickets. It, it's, 
a lot of people that just don't think about it like, oh, I spend a dollar a day and I'm just hoping that it's going to, you know, pay off for me. Okay. Keeping a budget is too restrictive. Okay. Bruce, do you want to just mention real quick for a second? Um, I know we were going to have Bill King talk about some stuff unless you want to hit that later, but later. Okay. So, but this one really spending without one is a luxury and you, you know, that, that just like with our, you know, our uh, spiritual life, you know, some people would argue, especially folks that aren't within the church, maybe don't come from a Christian paradigm, they would say, oh, well, you know, God just wants to take away your fun. You know, you can't party and do whatever you want. You guys have all these rules. Like, no, you know, uh, Spencer brought it up before we talked about why we fast. We don't want to be slaves to our passion. We don't want to just because you you are a slave at that point. You're not in charge. That's not free. Free is, no, I step back. I want this. I don't want that. Okay. The, the slave is just, you know, you're being led around by the chain doing whatever, you know, whatever pulls on you. So the a budget really w does give us freedom. And I would say on a specific level to get, you know, get a couple of specific examples, you know, freedom is like uh, you know when your your kids getting married or something like that, and you don't have to take out a mortgage against your house to pay for it. And by the way, you know I was gonna say we got like we got three dads in here that chose to have three daughters. You know we got Perry, Tony, and Rudy. And I was gonna I don't know if that was the best decision, but <laughs> so anyway, I I only had one daughter, so it was a little easier for me. But anyway. Okay, last one, people who make money investing are lucky. And I would, I would argue that, uh, and, and again, we're only going to cover briefly on investing, but I, again, I want to break the paradigm because if you didn't come from a strong money management background, like if, you're, if you didn't have good family teaching or it wasn't an important thing in your life, then this can be something that just, you know, you know the Warren Buffetts and the, you know, these big stock investors, whatever, real estate moguls, it can just feel like these, you know, people that are aliens. And it's really not that hard. The, the key is you just, you have to stick with some simple stuff. Like, like one thing I do, I, I joke, it's like a, um, you know, your shampoo bottle, lather, rinse, and repeat. I, I invest in a, a bunch of mini storages. I'm a, we have little limited partnerships in a number of them that we've been in for 20, 30 years. And, Mini storages are really boring. They're really boring. But every quarter, I get checks in the mail. And it's just, you know, like 15 checks show up. It's like, oh, $500, $1,000, $800. And, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just a simple thing. And I didn't, I didn't have to make some grand, you know, analysis, whatever. So, okay. And the bonus thing is in terms of budgeting, is, is, it, just, is it just too hard? And... Again, whether whatever age strata we have in here, it don't give in to that. It's not too hard. Okay, it is not too hard. And I would say if, if people say it's it's just too hard to to figure out how to budget and save and do this stuff, I you know seriously, and I, I hate I, I don't like to you know dig too much into you know twisting the the knife in somebody, but you know honestly, if we if we're gonna take that line of logic, you have to really ask yourself. Do I do I love myself? Do I love my family? Do I love God? I mean, we're called to be good stewards. So so please don't take that cop out that it's too hard. Okay, we're gonna hit a few more things real quickly here. Um, again, I'm an engineer, so sorry you're gonna have to put up with my um, science analogies. But the conservation of money. Okay, money. I I we said earlier, Brian got twenty dollars for saying money was simple. Okay, right? It, we can do it. So it's, it's actually a pretty straightforward thing. There is, there is you know, you got, you got income coming in and you've got your household expenses, which are rent and your car and food and all that. And so that's, that's what's coming out. So there is no magic fairy that comes in and somehow adds, you know, something in the middle there. You, ha you make money, you spend it, and... It's just kind of a closed system. So there's only really two options. And the uh, Robinson girls can't answer this because one of them was talking to me after church on Sunday. So, 
Okay, what, what do you think the two options are when it comes to budgeting and, and saving and our household expenses? <clears throat> what, what can we do with our budget? Increase income. Incre oh, very good. Very good. Make more money. Okay. You know what? You're going you're gonna to get a 20 for that. That was a good one. Okay, what's the other one? If we, we either make more or what? Spend less. Spend less. Very good. Who, who said that? Joby. Okay, Joby. All right, you're going to get two, okay, because we got to spend less. Okay, power of what can be. <laughs> okay, Albert, Albert Einstein is often associated with this quote that the greatest, you know, remember he was, who remembers what Einstein was famous for? Not, not looking like that, what was it? E equals, yeah, rel relativity, you know, E equals MC squared, okay? So, and supposedly, he also said the greatest power in the universe is compound interest. Okay, how many people in this room think they, and I, I would actually expect this answer to be very low. How many people in this room understand compound interest? Okay, okay, a few, all right? We'll hit this real quick. So here's how it works real basically. So if you have $1,000 and you're making 10% on it, that's $100 a year, okay? Stay with me, Marhofer girls. This is good, important stuff, okay? Now, in the second year, so you, you, you made $100, so now you can add your $100 to your original 1,000. You start with 1,100, you make 10%, that's $110. So then in the, in the third year, now the 110 gets added, you're starting with 1,210, 10%. So you can see, after three years, you started with 1,000, now you got 1,331. And the key there is, it's the idea of compounding is you're not just making interest off your principal, which is the thousand dollars. That's what you started with. That's your principal. But then you're making interest on top of interest. Okay. So that's compound interest and just real simple. You know, if, if people maybe who don't understand this, you say, if you make 10% a year, how long will it take you to double your money? A lot of people, a, a lot of people would say 10 years. Okay. 10 years, right? 10, oh, 10% a year, it's going to take me 10 years. No, it actually takes seven years to double your money because you're making interest on top of interest. And this, this rule of 72, it's not important, the math of it, but the simple thing is, is whatever interest rate you're at, you divide that into 72, and that'll tell you how many years it'll take to double your money. So if you're making 5% interest, it would be 14.4 years, okay? So compound interest is a beautiful thing, and just a big picture example if you put $10,000 in for 25 years, that would grow to 108,000. After 40 years, it grows to almost half a million dollars. Okay, that, that's from a one-time investment of $10,000. One-time investment of $10,000, 40 years later, could grow to 452, okay? Now, I wanted to give a couple specifics because again, I know the, call, the schools do a really poor job of teaching people about um, how to read interest rates and bank statements. So just real quick on this. This was a credit card statement. And you see there's uh, the balance was $924. And I circled there the, with the minimum payment. And in the upper right corner, $27 is the minimum payment. If you make the minimum payment, it will take you four years, four years to pay back that $900. And you're going to pay back $1,411 because guess what? The banks, they're doing the compound interest thing against you for them. They're happy to loan you 900 bucks because you've got to pay them back 1400 bucks, okay? Now this one, this next one was kind of a fun one. This was just a random one that showed up in my mail as an offer. And, and uh, I thought, <laughs> I, I, I grabbed the, I noticed one of the, the payment amounts was 666. I thought, oh, you know, okay, I'm going to just pick that one. It's like the mark of the beast. So you but the look at that you borrow thirty thousand dollars and you pay back fifty six thousand dollars if you if you, you do this six hundred and sixty six dollar payment for eighty four months it comes up to fifty six thousand dollars so again you gotta think if you're gonna buy that thirty thousand dollar car if it it might really end up costing you fifty six thousand and again is a car is a car going up in value or down in value? down so after seven years 84 months is your what what's your what's your eighty five thousand dollar car going to probably be worth seven years from now twenty thirty thousand maybe 
yeah, if you're lucky, 40, if you're lucky. So you're going to, you know, you're going to pay, gosh, I don't even want to do the math, like $160,000 for that car over eight years. And then you're going to, it's going to be worth 30,000 bucks. Okay. All right. Uh, I wanted to, I wanted to get some, some relevant uh, things. I was thinking, you know, I knew we'd have some young people here today. So I wanted to pick some, <laughs> some good stuff. So, so now again, I'm not picking on tattoos. In fact, I was thinking the last time we did this, uh, Father Turbo was here, who was a tattoo artist. And then Bruce is going to talk about spending your money and making your own choices. So I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, but just realize this is what it can grow to. If, if, if you get that, I, I looked it up and said it's average between one and $6,000 for a full sleeve tattoo. And so I said, well, let's pick a middle of the road, 3,000. So if you're 20 years old, uh, 40 years later, that, that tattoo could have grown to uh, 135. By the time you're 80 years old, it could have be almost a million dollars. And just for fun, I put that, you know, what if you're 100 years old, you're looking down at that sleeve tattoo and going, that thing could be worth $6 million, you know? It's, it's, it's kind of shocking the way uh, compound interest can work, okay? <laughs> you better insure your arms for a million dollars each, okay? <laughs> okay, I, I told you earlier, we, my neighbor kid with the Maserati, okay? So just for fun, I ran the numbers on this. So he, I, I, just, I said, what if he put $5,000 down? So he had to finance 80000 over seven years. That comes out to a $1,200 a month payment. Now, I actually, I actually ran these numbers based on $1,000 a month because I thought, well, you're going to have to spend something on a car. So let's say you have a beater that's costing you $200 a month. Okay, so, so even just at a 1000 if you put $5,000 down and, and do $1,000 a month just for seven years, okay? I should have put the seven years up there. So if instead of buying that car, you did the same thing, but put it in a mutual fund at 10%, you'd have almost $700,000 by the time you're 45. By the time you're 60, you'd have almost $3 million. So just think about it. Do you really want the $85,000 Maserati? Or do you want to go, you know, I'd kind of rather have be able to retire at age 60 with $3 million in the bank. And again, this is, this is, this isn't a thousand dollars a month for the rest of your life. It was a five thousand dollar down payment, a thousand dollars a month for seven years, and you just put the money in there and let it run. Okay, just for fun, I said by the time you're eighty, you know, and and if you're the kind of person that would make this decision of investing, you're probably not going to need the money when you're sixty anyway. So guess what? You're probably by the time you're eighty, you're going to be leaving your kids twenty million dollars. You know, so think that way long term. You, you want, as I said before, the banks and stuff, you want the compounding to work for you, not against you, okay? So we talked about the $85,000 car, the tattoo. Let's, let's think some small stuff too, but how it can really add up. Okay, so let's say you're going out to, you know, every day you go to lunch. I don't think $8 is particularly expensive, a burger, fries, a Coke, or something like that. Okay, over the course of 40 years, you know, typical work life, you have, <laughs> You're working for 40 years. That that eight dollar a day, five days a week, at 10 percent would add up to almost a million dollars. Almost a million dollars. Now you have to eat. I for the first 25 years of my work life, I pretty much brown bagged it, and I brought a peanut butter and honey sandwich for 25 years. I literally did. Now I really like peanut butter and honey. It wasn't necessarily money driven, although. It, part of it was money driven. I hated the thought of spending, you know, uh, that much for lunch every day. Okay, what about uh, coffee? You know, any any anybody here is a regular regular uh, you know Starbucks person? Well, let's say okay, I won't make the answer for you. At your school, at your school, any or your work? Do you any coworkers, other school people come in with their coffee every day? Okay, okay. Your five dollar a day coffee at forty years that could you could have almost seven hundred thousand dollars if you again make the choice how bad do I want that cup of coffee and just recognize over the long term that choice daily can grow to almost seven hundred thousand dollars. If you want the coffee great, and sometimes I drink coffee and sometimes I don't a quick funny sideline on this um i 
Joby's uh, younger brother just graduated from high school and, and uh, his parents gave him a, a $200, if I understand this right, they gave him a $200 uh, visa card. And, but somehow it was tied to the parents' uh, account and so they could see what he was spending his money on. And they saw he had had, he had, had a $17 charge for a cup of coffee because he, he had it, he had like Uber Eats or DoorDash Del deliver the coffee to him at, at high school. And, you know, his parents were like, no, Timmy, you know, not, you don't want to pay $17 for a cup of coffee. And now again, if you really want it, it's your choice. And, you know, sometimes maybe, maybe that's the, the right choice to do. But uh, especially I think younger folks, you know, you kind of get in this mindset of like, oh, well, we just do Uber Eats and, you know, DoorDash and like, Wow, that's a seventeen dollar cup of coffee. You know, maybe I ought to make it myself for you know thirty cents. Okay, um, the lotto tickets I mentioned before. If you if you buy your you know one dollar a day instead of instead of uh, hoping for the lottery win, and you just let the money run, you'll end up with with about one hundred seventy grand after forty years. Okay, all right. Now this one, Bruce and I, Bruce and I uh, argued about this. Uh, Bruce didn't want me to put the higher percentages up there because, and, and the truth is, those are, it is tougher to get a 12 or 15%, but the only reason I wanted to show this was just, I wanted to show you what the lunch could look like. If you, the difference between 10, 12, and 15% rate of return, if you could manage a 15, which honestly is a little harder to do, but if you could get a 15% return, your lunch over the course of 40 years would actually be worth about $3 million. So just a, you know, just a, something to think about, okay? All right, and then what if, what if you just did, instead of saying you're crazy, Deacon Tom, uh, you know, brown bagging it for 25 years, what if you just did it for one year? What if for one year you choose to brown bag? And so you save eight, an $8 lunch five days a week, and you invest that money just one year and let it run. It would be worth about $90,000, you know? So again, some of you young people think, hey, Maybe I can do this for a, you know, give it up. So just a few quick things before I turn it over to Bruce and we'll take a quick break. But if you, if you, one of Dave Ramsey's favorite expressions, if you live like nobody else, you will live like nobody else. And, you know, this, this is one of those things where our culture tells you to spend. You have to dress a certain way. You have to have certain jewelry. You have to uh, certain go out to eat, do whatever, and drive certain kind of cars. It's like, no, if you're willing to, you know, not follow the, the herd, you can, uh, you can have a little different view of life. So, you know, if you're, you know, what's the expression about following the herd? You know, unless you're the lead dog, the view never changes. You know, you're just, <laughs> so that's, that's not a fun place to be. And uh, last couple quick things here. Anybody heard of the distribution of wealth theory? I would, this doesn't surprise me. Okay, there's uh, the distribution of wealth theory. You know, there, there's a lot of talk in our culture, especially in recent years, about inequality, right? And there's, the rich people have too much money. And so the, the distribution of wealth theory goes like this. If you took all the money in the world and you you divided it by the 8 billion people in the, in the world and you gave everybody the exact same amount of money that within about 10 years, the stratification would be roughly the same as it is today. And, and, you know, and it's interesting, I've seen a lot of people nodding their heads yes. And because the reality is some people would get their, you know, who know what the number is, $10,000 a person, whatever. So some people would get that $10,000 and what would they do? They would go to Costco and they would buy a big screen TV. And then what would some people would invest the money and they'd put it in a mutual fund. And, you know, or they would start designing better TVs and have people buy the TVs from them. So anyway, you the point being with that is you you don't want to be one of the, the people that are gonna just be non-thinking spenders. You want to make good rational decisions. Okay. Um, last two quick things. You gotta think long term. I know I put those, those, uh, all those um, money things up. We're, we're talking about 25, 40, even 60 years. You know, you know, it's funny. I was thinking about that even today. Okay, I am 61. 
Now, and, and you, you know, you could argue like, ah, dig Tom, you're kind of at the tail end, you know, you know, do you really want to still be saving and doing this stuff? I mean, my dad is 90 and he's still really healthy. My grandfather was 99 and he was healthy. He, when he, when he passed away, he, he never went to an old folks home. He was healthy till the last three months of his life. In all likelihood, I probably have a lot of longevity. I, I could have 30 or 40 years left in my life, you know? So 40 years, I mean, 40 years for you young guys, I mean, that's easy. Suck it up, save some money, plow it away. But even for those of us, and, I, and I'm probably close to the oldest person in this room, you know, even for me, I might have a 20, 30, 40 year run left that, you know, whether I choose to do something with it or give it to the church or charity or my family. So the last one, I really like this one. Money never sleeps. So this was a classic line from the movie Wall Street from, I don't know, 20 some years ago. But uh, the, you know, we talked about compound interest and that's the beauty. While you are sleeping, your money's in a mutual fund or real estate or whatever. And it's just, it's churning and it's doing its thing and you don't have to worry about it. It's just, it's just going to keep, keep working even while you're sleeping. Okay. Well, Deacon Tom and I have kind of gotten to the same place, but with different approaches. Um, I'm the tortoise. He's the hare. I've been the slow, methodical, when, it, you know, people will, uh, you know, when you talk to people and they say, what do you do? What's your job? Nobody's ever guessed my job. <laughs> a lot of you here know my job, but some of you don't know what I do. I'm a piano tuner, and whenever I tell someone I'm a piano tuner, they always say the same thing. They always go, really? <laughs> and then they'll say, can you make a living at that? Which is a great answer. Uh, I'm sorry, great question, because, you know, obviously I have, but um, I've been really blessed in that um, some of you here are married. I've had a partner with me that's pulled on the rope with me at the same time. And, you know, for those of you here who are married or considering getting married, they say one of three things can kill a marriage. Money, family, or sex. I've been married twice, and I will say that in my first marriage, what really tore us apart, really, for the most part, was money. And my ex-wife, bless her heart, is not here to defend herself, so I'm going to try to come to her defense. I'm sure if my first wife was here, she would have stories to you about how I was too controlling with money. And I bet... She's got, there's a lot of truth to that. So the answer here isn't to try to push down on the person who's more the spender and try to get them in line, but we're going to talk about a lot of that. I love it when I see young people here today. I see my grandsons. I see David. I see Ezra. I see Maya. I see Olivia and Emma. I see Julia and Elena and Bella. I, I love when I see young people because... You see this right here? This represents a road, okay? And there are forks in the road. Those of us that are older know that. There's forks in the road in your life. And of course, you don't realize it when you're young that you're at a fork in the road, but you are. Ezra, my grandson, David Bryan, my grandson. What? Oh, gosh. He is something. My grandsons, you know, I, uh, Limery's going to kill me. You guys need to be really thankful that Grandpa, that Papa is persistent because I asked Grandma to marry me four times. And the fourth time, she finally said yes. And had she not said yes, your mom would have never met your dad and you wouldn't be here today. <laughs> that was a fork in the road. And so there's all these, you realize that when you get older, there's forks in the road that change your life. Um, granted, how old are you? 40. 40, okay. Um, when I was 40, and maybe this is granite too, 
the Bruce of 40 would have loved to have taken the Bruce of 30 and slapped the crap out of him for some of the decisions he made. You know, I would have loved to have taken me and, sh and woke me up. I did every kind of stupid there could be. Every kind of stupid. So what this really is today, this is, it's kind of a motivational seminar. You guys, anybody know the, um, the uh, his name is Gad Sad, G-A-D-S-A-A-D, -A -A you know him? He actually was on Joe Rogan a week or two ago, and actually Megan Kelly interviewed him as well. He has a podcast called The Sad Truth About Happiness. Interesting guy. He grew up in uh, Beirut, Lebanon, war, t war torn in the day, went through a lot of hard times. One of the things he talks about is just how happy he is to be alive. His mother was very open with him about the fact that she, she he was not a planned pregnancy and she wanted to abort him. And only after family members came and convinced her to have the baby was he even came into the world. So he's just happy to be here. He enjoys life. He's happy. And he talked about recently that you know he lost 85 pounds and he just couldn't imagine doing it. But he decided day by day to make a decision. Every day he decided to change a little bit the way he ate. And he lost 85 pounds. It's that saying, yard by yard, life is hard inch by inch, it's a cinch. Um, I have a, a friend who I get together with regularly, actually having breakfast with him again this upcoming week, and he's wealthy, 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 wealthy. And we, we go to lunch every once in a while, and when I get together with him, he'll, I, I, I say, he'll say to me, um, boy, I don't go to lunch with people often. I say, well, why do you go with me? And he says, well, you know, I knew you'd be here on time. You know, he values time. He said, if you, sh if you borrow $100 from me, you can pay me back. But if you show up an hour late, I'll never get that hour back. But I've gone to Mark and asked sometimes his um, advice about money and what to do with money. Because he's really smart with it. And here's what he says to me. And he said it to me over and over and over again. And now I'm going to say it to you. Four words. What do you want? He said it to me and I thought, what is he talking about? I'm not expecting you to really understand that completely now. You're going to have to analyze it. I've had to figure that out in my life. What do I want? What do I really want in life? Ask yourself that when it comes to your money regularly. What do you want? Here's what we're not going to do today. I'm not going to tell you how to spend your money. I promise you I won't. I don't care. Well, I do care. <laughs> but if you decide you want to spend your money buying fancy clothes, it's your money. You get to. So we're not going to tell you how to spend your money. But what I am going to encourage all of us to do is, you know, as they say, a come to Jesus moment, an honest assessment of where your money's going. What's happening with it? You know, because here's the thing about money. If you don't direct it, it will leave you. If you're not intentional about your money and look at it, look at every dollar and say, where do you think you're going? If you're not intentional with your money, it will vanish. And if that's your call, that's your call. So we're going to get down now into the weeds. There are what I call, Stella and I were talking about this a little earlier, the four walls. There's four things in the world. And actually, in a second here, Ronnie, I'm going to ask you if you would pass these out to people. And this is only... Okay, Deacon Tom can do it. Put him to work. Don't do it yet. Okay. Um, this is just for you to, you don't even need to use it today, but it'll have these four things on there. There's what I call the four walls. There's four areas of everybody's life here. Well, maybe some of these areas don't completely apply because some of you still live at home, but we're even going to address that. Four areas that for the typical person, they cannot 
avoid. Anybody have any idea what any of the four are? Deacon Tom, you got any money, by the way? I do. Okay, good. Any idea? What are the what's one of the four? Rent. Housing. Okay. Candace. Okay, that's one of the four walls. Okay, you gotta have a roof over your head. Any yes, Brian. No. That's not one of the four. Mary. Food. Food is one of the four. Wait, who said food? Mary. And food is very important to Mary because she's eating for two right now. Noah. Clothing. He's right. That's. Okay. Clothing is one of the four. There's one more. Helena. You're warm. Yeah. Transportation. Transportation. So look. To survive, yeah, car, you got it. Anyway, learning how to spell is important. Uh, okay, so these are the four that you've got to have. Uh, the reason I rejected taxes is, yeah, you're right, sooner or later the government will come after you, but to survive on a day-in, day-out basis, you have to have these. Now, in these areas, I, I'm going to even encourage you. You've got a little paper in front of you. You can write it down. This is to yourself. I promise you we're not going to ask you to reveal it to us. Typically, in these four, there can be areas of weakness. Are any of these four weaknesses for you? This is a rhetorical question nobody needs to answer. Okay, there are people who, I mean, housing. I'm going to tell you a story about housing with people. Okay, um, maybe your weakness is food. You like to go out to eat too much. You spend too much money on food. You could eat a cheaper way. Clothing. You like to go to Nordstrom's instead of going to a thrift store. Okay, transportation. Obviously, although I got to tell you, when Deacon Tom was talking about uh, a car being a depreciating asset, I got to brag about my grandson. He went out and he saved $18,000, my grandson, right there. Okay? And he bought his first car. Okay? It's a car that will not go down. Father Mike loves this. He saw it. He bought a World War II Jeep. That'll probably be worth more money in a few years. But in any case, uh, Cars are an area of vulnerability, okay? So I'm going to tell you a story about housing. One of my clients, uh, who I've known for years, a doctor, wealthy doctor, saw him move into nicer and nicer and nicer houses. Spent too much money. Now, he's passed away now, but he's left his widow... She now lives in a, she's got a roof over her head, but she's in a uh, lake park. What are those called? A mobile home park. She's in a mobile home park now, okay? And again, she's fine, but compared to how she was living before, he spent too much money on housing. He, he let me tell you, when you are not in debt, the ground feels different on the house you're walking through. My wife and I have been disciplined and paid off our house. Um, that took sacrifice. While people were re putting in new carpet, we were not. We sacrificed for years. We lived like nobody else so that now we can live like nobody else. Um, transportation. I have another friend, good friend of mine, who's actually just become orthodox, but he's a doctor. And he spent too much money regularly over the years. Poor decisions. And he and I met for breakfast, uh, uh, and he had to Uber to breakfast and asked me to give him a ride home because he really started getting real about what was happening with his finances. And he realized he couldn't afford a car. He has a car now, but it was only after he started disciplining himself and getting real about what was happening with his money. So these are the four the four areas, and there's probably one of these four areas you are vulnerable in.
And again, it's your money. You get to decide. Okay? I will tell you a story about when I was 37, David, your dad was uh, 13, Ezra, your mom was 15. I went out and I had saved my money and I bought a 1991 Honda Civic. And I, it's the first time I'd ever done this. I paid cash for this car. It was $9,100. I was so happy. I was so happy. Okay, this little Honda Civic. And I, I had had it a couple months, and I was just loving it. I had no, no car payment. No car payment. But I realized something. If I had a car payment, you know I'd make it. And so I started decide, I decided I was going to make a car payment to myself. And so even though I didn't have a car payment, I decided I did. So I made a $300 car payment to myself. I put $300, first of all, into an envelope. Over time, I finally started putting it in the bank. And uh, if you're sharper, perhaps you know the stock market and would put it in a stock. But in any case, uh, about six months later, I was at my brother's house my younger brother, and we're competitive. And I said, hey, I like, like this car. I'm going to keep this car a while. And he said to me, you won't. You'll get bored with it. And I thought, he's right. Because what happens with people is you get bored with things. I want something shiny and new. Deacon Tom was talking about that earlier. And so just to prove my brother wrong, because I'm so competitive, I kept that car 11 years. Okay, It had 330,000 miles on it. Okay. 11 years at $300 a month with compound interest. I was at like $44,000. Lynn Marie and I used that for the final way to pay off our house. It changed my life, that decision. For some of you that are here now, okay, you may be at the point now you've got a job. Young people, maybe you're working. Okay, Maybe you're close to getting, getting a job. But guess what? Sooner or later, like... Some of you maybe have a car, but you don't have a car payment. You could consider having a car payment. That starting to be part of your life. This church here, the parish council, I, I'm on parish council right now. Granite has been on parish council. He's been a, Joby's been on parish council. And councils have decided together we were going to be disciplined, and we paid off this building. Colleen's been on council. Candace is on council. I'm probably forgetting others. Stella's not part of council, but she's part of everything, so don't ever forget that. In any case, um, we decided to pay off this parish. The ground feels different now when we walk through here. Okay? But here's what we did. We decided, after we paid it off through previous councils, thank you guys for sticking with this, we decided to keep making the payment. We decided to, Nadia is our bookkeeper, she knows this. Every month, Nadia, what do we do? 12000 12, thank you. $12,500 a month goes into the bank, the, which we call it the building fund. We have almost now a million dollars in our building fund. Okay, because and it's done two things. Number one, we're saving money. Number two, the other thing it's done, and I think this is vitally important, is the parish is used to a payment. Because we hope to, by the grace of God, get into another building someday, and at least we'll be used to financially having a payment. So for any of you that have a car, and let's say you're fortunate fortunate enough to not have a payment. But guess what? Someday you will have a car payment. And it, if you're used to making that payment, it'll be part of your life. If you're used, I, I even consider to people that aren't paying rent, young people, you know, some parents decide over time, I'm going to start charging you rent. Start getting ready now. Maybe some of you rent now. And you're thinking, ooh, my rent may jump 
real quick. I, Go I, ahead. I think Tony should start charging those two. <laughs> Um, if you if you're renting right now, and let me tell you, there's things about renting that I like. Don't ever apologize for renting. Uh, it helps avoid some of the unforeseens that happen when you own. My wife and I just got we own our house, but we just got hit with a couple unforeseens this last week. You know that I wouldn't have had to deal with if I rented. But if you're renting, another thing that is a possibility is that, and a probability is your rent's going to go up. Start paying that increase right now. Just pay it to yourself. Start, it, it, it's, it's a mind frame. It's being, in, what I'm really talking about is you considering being intentional with your money. You must be intentional with your money. Now, we have single people here. We have married people here. Okay? If you're single, you, it's kind of, you're the boss, okay? You get to decide on your own what you're going to do with your money. You decide. You don't have to worry about anyone else. If you're married, there's someone else to consider, okay? Now, at this point, what I'm going to do before I come back up is there's two guys here that we've asked to come up. Deacon Tom and I are going to change places and sit where they're sitting. I'm going to ask Joby and Granite to come up because they have... Um, well, they've come to some of our seminars from years ago, and they're going to come up. They have no idea. Well, they have a rough idea of what we're going to ask them. So, guys, come on up. Do you want to start with a question, or I will? Okay. The first question I want to ask, um, Granite. Um, you and Steph, you guys have been married how long? 15 years. When you got married, were you on the, the general same page with money? Sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah, generally, generally, yes. Was one of you more of a saver than the other? No. Okay. Okay, so you were on equal, equal footing for the most part. Yes. Okay. Joby, what about you and Aaron? Uh, generally, we were on the same page. She was more of a saver than me. She was more of a saver than you. Yes. Okay. Do you have any idea? Like, uh, like your, like, I'm going to go back to Granite and then to Joby. Uh, Granite, your, your parents, did you have good examples of money with your parents growing up? 50-50. 50-50. So my mom and grandmother... Good examples. My father and his family, not so great examples. Okay. Joby, what about you? Um, <clears throat> it was uh, not something that I really paid attention to. Uh, I mean, I understood that like we had our, our four walls, but um, they didn't really intentionally instill any good or bad examples in me. So uh, I guess... Did I have an example? I might have. I just didn't pay attention to it. <laughs> and they never had us like talk about money or anything like that. I mean, like you know, there was some very, very, very basic stuff. But that was it. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to ask. So, if you, when, if you, I'm sure there were times when you had a conflict, maybe. So, how would you guys arrive at a? Had a solution when one spouse said, "Hey, we need a new car," and the other said, "No." Did you ever run into that situation or not? Um, no. I would say, you know, for Stephanie and I, um, we spend differently. Okay. Um, and so um, we're usually pretty amicable about it. However, like Stephanie will spend um, rabbit trails, like a little here, a little there. Right, you know, and then uh, I make big purchases. So, um, you know, when I go out and spend three hundred dollars, you know, it's it's feels different than spending five here or ten there. Um, and over time, um, I think we have come to like a consensus about our discretionary spending spending and how we do it. Um, Joby, any thoughts, comments on that? 
Um, I mean, that kind of sounds familiar. Uh, I, I would look at it, and it's funny to look at it like over the years because our spending has changed because like our, our situation is different. But, um, it, you know, like I said, Aaron is more of the, the saver. Um, but my, and, and I wasn't like spending a lot. None of us were spending a lot. But it wasn't like necessarily little things. It was, I was looking at more of a big picture type thing. So I would look at something like, oh, well, we can save money if we, we're going to use these things anyway, so let's get like a bulk type thing. And there would be times when she would say like, yes, over time that's going to save, but we can't afford to do that right now. So it would be something that, all right, well, I guess we just won't do it. And you know, in the long run, it was actually fine to not have some of those things. Do you guys, um, like, granted, do you and Steph do, well, was there a period of time where, uh, like, did you start literally, like, writing out a budget? Did you ever do that? We we have, and it's changed right. over time. So um, 15 years ago, you know, we came to a Bruce and Tom uh, roadshow, and, um, you know, we committed, all right, we've got to get our finances, finances in order. You know, we were, like, newly married, and starting our life and um we were pretty undisciplined and so it, it was okay let's get a budget going and it was much tighter um bruce-esque budget of like you know how much toothpaste am i spending um and in an envelope um and now over years it's like bigger buckets right. and right. less right. Right. less detailed right. um and periodically we go back and revisit those buckets um at sort of key milestones um we've readjusted that budget and what our priorities are and those kinds of things um so so we've been on a budget and we committed together to doing them and it's sort of evolved over time of what that budget looks like and the practices we use so so you said you're 40. Mm -hmm. so the granite of 40 he basically, if he could go back and talk to the granite at 28, he'd say, good job on some of those decisions, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> You're happy with the granite of 28. Yeah. Show me. Uh, uh, budget, you and Aaron, did you guys, how did you guys do that? We didn't start a written budget until also I think we had uh, probably come here. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we, we weren't out of control of our spending. Actually, the budget, what it allowed us to do was to see that we could spend on stuff that we didn't realize we could. Uh, like when we first got married, um, I was working at a mall and Aaron was at a temp agency, so we knew we didn't have a lot of money. And so we were just thinking, well, we just need to not spend money. And so like we didn't have ketchup and mustard these days. You know, like we thought, oh, we can't afford that. It's not until you actually start to put down on paper like what you have and then what you, you know, what you can get, you know, the decisions that you make with that sort of written budget. So when we first started, um, you know, we, we didn't realize that we could have more. And just like Granite, over the years, um, the budget's gotten kind of uh, less detailed. Um, but because it started, by the time we actually started it, we were able to make those better decisions into like where we thought about having. You know, okay, I'm glad you brought up that thing about the cash and mustard. Because the, the question I wanted to ask was, you know, I, I had the slide up there a while ago about, well, a budget's too restrictive. And I, I postulated that it actually creates freedom. Now, don't let me stack the deck. I want to hear your honest assessment. Did you, did you, did a budget feel like, oh gosh, we can't have fun, we can't do this? Or, or am, am I correct in saying that it actually created freedom? Again, feel free to disagree, but how, how did that work out for you guys? I, I think it absolutely it's absolutely created freedom. Um, as long as you have reasonable expectations, but then if if within that budget you say that there is uh, uh, you know a line for entertainment or something like that, then that money's already been allotted to that. You don't have to feel bad about going to see a movie or something like that. If you don't have that budget though, then again, like we didn't know. Oh man, we really don't want to don't want to be spending money we don't have, so we didn't buy the dollar thing of you know whatever in our, in our refrigerator. We didn't have any of that stuff. So yes, it, it, I think there's a lot more freedom to have that budget where you realize you 
and beauty. So Rose, I, I, I don't know that it was, um, we didn't feel constrained by a budget. Um, it was more of like your opening statement, Deacon, about the yes. And so what you say yes to, you're excluding something else, right? And so it was making room for yeses was a driving force in our budgeting. So in our budgeting, you know, it was um, prioritization of giving as a household. It was prioritization of um, the goal of buying a home. It was prioritization of things. So we had like a, a, a positive approach to, to budgeting, if that makes sense. It wasn't about like, what are we cutting out? It was about what are we wanting to get to? Guys, thank you. This is great. Appreciate you sharing. And uh, the last thing is that in your age group and the people that you know of, do you see a lot of people your age, and, and it's kind of a weird question, struggling, obviously, but struggling financially and just the, the, the tight loose. Yeah, I, I got plenty of people that I work with. Um, uh, you know, I mean, people tell me you're talking about when you graduated college, people buying cars and stuff like that. I can't tell you how many my coworkers, they want to get the new car or whatever the new toy is, or I, you know, I had a, a partner and I, and I love him. I love him so much. And, um, you know, we were partners for years and his name is, his name is Bobby. And there was a police officer. There would be plenty of times where he would be talking about doing something. And I was like, oh, you can't do that. No, you know, you can't do that. And his response was, well, that's future Bob's problem. And, uh, <laughs> the problem is, he's going to become future Bob. So, um, it, and that's unfortunately a, a, a all too common uh, financial mindset is like, eh, I'll worry about that later. So uh, Stephanie and I have made like a conscious family decision from an early stage that we were going to be a single income household. And we made sacrifices along the way to do that. And I look at my work peers where that's an anomalous thing altogether, right? Like there's, you are a two household income and you're my colleague. So like, you know, I have a rough ballpark of what you make and the financial decisions you make. And, and I don't understand, like, it, you know, it's, it's tough for me to fathom of like how that works because I don't think it is working and it probably isn't. And it's going to catch up to future Bobby. Right. And, um, you know, I'm like, of course I don't you know, go out and buy a new car, you know, of course I'll get it fixed again. <laughs> you know, of course, um, we're not traveling to Europe, you know, <laughs> we're not doing these big things, um, that I see my colleagues do. And then it's like, you know, well, have you set up your 403B, you know, do you have your tax sheltered account that you're contributing to? Oh no, I haven't done that yet. Because the granite of 50 will want to hug the granite of 40. <laughs> and, but yeah, but so I see it both ways. I see like, you know, the sort of, I don't know, poor consumer decisions people make. Um, then I also see the, um, I don't know, poor consumer decisions people make, but also, like, that has life consequences, you know? Like, the benefit of making these sacrifices early in our household, in our kids' lives, um, I don't know. They're much bigger than a 401k, you know? and um, I don't know, just, just my reflection on looking at colleagues and peers. Um, so yeah. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. I'll let you know. I got a few more. Again, I'm looking at you young people that are here. And, uh, oh gosh. For you young people that are here, if you can get in these habits, Oh my gosh, now. And before I forget, Armin, raise your hand. Armin's right here. Turn around, look where Armin is. There is an app. It's called, uh, uh, what's it? Called the YNAB. YNAB, YNAB. And I checked. You need a budget. Yeah. That's what it stands for. Yeah, yeah. You need a budget. And, it, and I've checked it out. It's an app you can get that will really help. I've used envelopes in this computer age. Other people don't and you want it an app that'll 
but talk to Armin. He can connect you with YNAB and show you about this. Why NAB? You need a budget. Great, great tool to be used. Another thing, and all these things hit me. I had an amazing moment about two weeks ago with Mr. Sanchez here. Okay, I'm standing out front, and he and his lovely wife Stacy drive up in their Honda. Right? Is it a Honda? Yeah, Honda Accord. Honda Civic. Okay, and they have three little girls. Okay, and they found a way that they got little more narrow car seats to put in the back. So the girls are kind of tight in the back, and uh, Stacy gets out of the car, and I said, wow, you guys are a minivan waiting to happen, right? And she said, yeah, well, no, we've decided we, do they need a minivan? No. They'd like one. It'd be nice. He's into the bigger why. Could he probably find a way to go out and spend that money? He's not. He's denying himself now looking at a bigger picture. I love that. That just, oh man, I just chills up and down my spine. Okay. Home stretch here. One of the things I want you to do is realize that in life to expect the unexpected. The unexpected's coming. Okay. It's going to come. You want to do as much as you can to avoid the unexpected. Now, for those of you that still live at home, you can avoid a lot of this. But guess what? The day's coming. You're not going to be living at home. You're going to be on your own. The unexpecteds are coming. You know, before you know it, you're pregnant with your second kid. You know. Um, so, how Lynn Marie and I have done it is we have taken money every month in actually put it into different envelopes, okay? I'm gonna write out and I'm gonna, like we have, for years we had an envelope for housing, okay? We had one for food, we had one for clothing. One of the reasons Deacon Tom wanted to be a deacon is he's only had to wear one outfit to church the whole time. That black cassock, he saved money. We had an envelope for transportation, now, we've had other envelopes. I have an envelope for insurance, okay? I had an envelope for taxes. I had an envelope for, you're going to crack up at this one, believe it or not, trees. Why? Well, I figured out after a couple years where we live, we got all these trees that regularly need to be trimmed. And if I didn't plan for that, it would slap me upside the head. When I said insurance, you know, if you don't plan for insurance, all of a sudden, before you know it, there's a car insurance premium that's due. And if you haven't planned for it, it hits you upside the head. You haven't planned for it. But that's the truth about your budget. Okay? Now, here's the thing. And Granite spoke about it. Joby spoke about it. It started, their budget's changed over the years. Ours has changed over the years. And the truth is, your budget, at the beginning, you will constantly, if you decide to do this, be altering it. Oh, this budget's too small. I need to increase this. This one maybe I allotted too much for. What Granite didn't tell you is he and Steph just got back from a, cool, a, a cruise to Alaska, right? They saved their money. Lynn Marie and I, we've, we've had a uh, envelope, and right now that envelope is called We Leave in in uh, four weeks, and we go to Switzerland. And let me tell you, the greatest vacation you ever go on in your life is a vacation that you go on that doesn't follow you home, where the credit card bill doesn't come the next month. That's the greatest vacation. We just got back family vacation with my grandkids to Hawaii. Great vacation. It didn't follow us home because we planned for it. So again, I'm not going to tell you how to do this, but I'm going to encourage those of you that are single and you don't have to deal with the spouse, okay? You get to be honest about where your money's going. Start charting out every dollar and seeing what do I value? I decide, you know what? I want to go spend a third of my budget at Nordstrom's each month your money. You get to decide. Just be honest about it and look where it's going. Just be honest. For those of you that are married, 
Okay? One of you is the spender, one of you is the saver. You have to decide your budget together. You have to, if you have to, prick your finger, sign it in blood. There is a term that I use regularly called financial infidelity. Okay? Marital infidelity is when someone becomes unfaithful in the marriage, breaks the marriage vow, and that's a taboo. That's a no-no. To me, financial infidelity is a different kind of bad. I, I can't tell you it's as bad, but it is, to me, unfathomable. If you've agreed on a budget together and someone breaks that budget, you need to at least have a talk about it. Okay? Lynn Marie and I had been married probably six months when I went out and bought these two motorcycles for our boys. And if you looked over her, at her right now, she's still angry about it. Okay? <laughs> she's got that look. Okay? I, I went out and did that on my own without talking to her. I broke the budget. Oh, that was 34 years ago. It's still fresh. Okay? Um, you need to plan. I'm going to end with one quick story. It's a great story. Um, you know, you need to plan for the future. We've planned for the Hawaii trip. We planned for Switzerland. You know, uh, uh, I will never forget one time we decided, we had a condo down in San Diego, and we decided, you know what, we invite different friends down, and we decided to invite Tom and Wendy down to the uh, condo this one weekend with us. So they came down to the condo with us. And so it was a Friday night, and I said to Deacon Tom, hey, let's, let, you know, where do you want to go to dinner tonight? And he goes, I don't know. You want to, is there a good steak place here? Actually, probably it was a Saturday night, so no fat, so we didn't, you know, the fast. I, I honestly don't remember which night, one of the nights, but the point is there was a Ruth's Chris down there, a beautiful Ruth's Chris on the water. So we went out to Ruth's Chris, and the waiter comes up at the end of the meal and says, are we celebrating anything tonight? And as I'm getting ready to say, no, we're not, Deacon Tom interrupts me, puts his arm around Wendy, and he says, well, me and this good lady today are celebrating our 25th wedding anniversary. And I'm like, it's your, and it all hits me crap, I got to buy dinner, okay? <laughs> Not only do I have to buy dinner, this dude found a way on his 25th wedding anniversary. Lynn Marie, is this a true story? Yeah, okay. On his 25th wedding anniversary, he found a way to get away for the whole weekend to a place for free, and his dinner got paid for, okay? Brilliant. Use your head, you know, a brilliant... <laughs> Brilliant story. So, okay. Are you going to do the have to do the handouts or not? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Take the handouts. Um, maybe we can just take ten minutes for categories. Yeah. Of, you, you, okay. Cause go here's, ahead. Here's what we wanted to do. So, you know, I told you we we didn't. We didn't want to. Uh, we didn't. We didn't want to have you go away empty-handed. So we'll we'll call it a combo break and work out, break out. And I was going to say, even the younger folks, okay? I there's going to come a point where you guys are going to say, "Mom, Dad, I'm going to go live on my own." And and there's there's been, uh, you know, there's the proverbial story of mom and dad saying, "Well, you know, fine. How are you going to pay for your rent?" You're like what's rent so even you younger folks you might not have a clue as to what these things cost but just put down your best guess and then i'd love to see the parents or grandparents you know maybe lynn marie you can help your guys I'd, I'd i'd love to see what you guys you know write down for clothing and rent and food and gas and all that insurance and all that stuff and um, it'd be a good exercise so let's just take no more than 10 minutes and uh, bruce anything specific you wanted to add on that Again, the, the, the bridge between a dream and the, its reality is the plan. You know, the, the, the bridge 
for granted to all of a sudden instead of going on a vacation that I bet you like anything he had paid for before he went was a plan. And one, one thing you guys can do to make this easier, I, I saved this for nostalgic reasons. You'll see the very last sheet of this four-page handout I gave. This was, it says 1979. This, this is, when, when I was 16 years old, about the age of some of these young folks here, this is what I was taught about how to keep a budget and learn how to tithe. And that's why the tithe, you'll notice, that's the very first line item on the budget, the tithe, because that, you know, that's a good place to start. But anyway, this, this can be a good starting point, and you, know, you can just jot numbers off to the side of, of this one if you don't want to fill out the blank sheets of the first ones, and this you can take home. But hey, it just gives you an idea, gas, food, water, trash, home maintenance, clothes, etc. Restaurants, entertainment, gifts, it's got a lot of good, good uh, items there. So anyway, we'll take just... I do promise you, too, that the more you budget, the more freedom you're going to have. You, 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 you think it's restrictive, you're going to have more money. I promise you. You're just not going to believe Bill King, who's not here today, wanted to come here. Bill had something happen. Somebody stole the catalytic converter out of his oh, little Honda uh, Toyota Prius. This was about six months ago. He called me and said, you know, because it was going to be $900. He called me and said, go to fucking Brucey. He said, Brucey, I'm so happy. What's up? He goes, well, I wasn't happy that my catalytic converter was stolen. What I was happy for is all I had to do was go into my envelope that said car repair, and I had 900 of those $925 because he planned for the unexpected. We, we've talked a lot about do we love money? Do I love money? You know what? I, I'm really I'm not motivated by a car. Or, I, I, love I love the freedom that having the stress gone of money gives. I love freedom. So that's what the goal is, is to have so that when you're 10 years older than now, you want to hug the person now. So anyway, first of all, Armin. Armin, I had mentioned about wine ad. Ar Armin, address what you just said to me. Yeah, so after all this great information and motivation, there's the what next. And envelopes is a great system, yeah. but for the modern era, um, you know, there's ways of doing this digitally with apps, with an app. And if you have interest, if you're motivated now to, to make some changes with this, we can work as a team. Um, I've dug in and I've learned this app a little bit, not an expert at it, but we can learn it together and motivate each other. So um, if you'd like to go that direction, I'm willing to help and start a little community where, where we can help each other with this. So please contact me and let me know if you'd like to do that. I recommend Armin. He's, he's good with money. He's ran two successful businesses. He knows what he's talking about. Um, okay. Uh, and he's a pretty good surfer, too. Yeah. A uh, couple things. Uh, wanting to buy a house. The house prices, obviously, in Southern California are absolutely ridiculous and insane. Now, it's been interesting since we did the last financial seminar I mentioned in church. There's been two meltdowns that have happened since we had the last one. First meltdown was 2008, the mortgage crisis, the world just went, and then, of course, COVID. Now, I have a client that lived in Placentia that they didn't own a house. They rented a house, and uh, Tracy didn't ever think they'd have a house. But what Tracy did do was she just kept saving her money and saving her money and saving her money and saving her money. And she just did. It was just part of her life. She always lived beneath her means. And if there's anything I could tell you, live beneath your means, not above, not at your means, live beneath your means. And so all of a sudden the mortgage meltdown happened in 2008. She bought a beautiful house out in Corona because the market went down. It could happen again. Save your money. Or perhaps you'll save your money and you'll move out of the area. Understand, get it. Last thing before I go to Deacon Tom, one thing we didn't do, and this is Dave Ramsey stuff, but I so agree. The very first thing anyone should do, the very first thing, I don't care how much debt you have, I don't care your financial situation, do you have an emergency fund? An emergency fund. Granted. Step one, do you know, or Joby, how much money should you have in that step one emergency fund? Do you know? 
You remember? Dave Ramsey? Yeah. $1, How much? $1,000. Bingo. $1,000. The very first thing to do, you need to put $1,000 in a fund in, in, in a, that you don't touch. It's not a slush fund. It's not something you go in and out. That's your emergency fund. You ha that's step one. That's a given. Step two, get rid of your debts. Okay? Credit cards. How do you get rid of, let's say you've got multiple credit cards. What do you do? Which one do I attack first? You attack the one with the smallest balance. People say, well, why not that? Why should I do that? Why don't I attack the one that has the highest interest rate? You, money, it's, it's not about numbers. It's about behavior. Attack the one that has the smallest amount of debt because once you pay that off, okay, and of course you'll have to make the minimum payments on the other, but attack that smallest one, you get success from emptying that one, it's out of your life, then take that extra money, go to the next one, it's called the debt snowball, start, get that success builds on each other, get rid of the credit cards, and then, unless Joe Biden changes things, and he wants to, the other big area is student loan debt. Student loans are not bankruptable, you cannot get rid of them, okay? Get rid of your student loan debt, okay? And then step three, once you've gotten rid of your credit card debts and you have your emergency fund established, it is slowly and surely you wanna to get to the point where you have three to six months of your bills in an account to prepare for the future for the unknowns. Uh, we had a couple unknowns hit us this week. Fortunately, we're fine. So again, uh, those are th there's more baby steps than that. There's two more, but I just hit the first three to be the All right, thanks, Bruce. Yeah, yeah can you raise I'll those? Turn I'll turn this. Okay, yeah. okay um, I wanted to hit for just a moment, we'll have a little bit of fun here, do some saving brainstorming. We have, we have a lot of smart people in here. And just wanted to do rapid fire, just hear some ideas of how how we what ideas we can do to save money. So automate. What's that? Automate. Automate. Okay. What do you mean, like your bills or saving? Yeah. Oh, oh, beautiful, beautiful. Okay, great. So so uh, automate your savings. Right. So you have X X amount going into an account without even thinking about it. Excellent. Bruce, give him a couple bucks. He deserves it. Okay. In, in, uh, David Braun. Kirkland. Kirkland, okay. <laughs> buy, buy off off brands. And isn't it, you know, Kirkland, half of the time their stuff's better quality than the other stuff. So And it's cool now. Hey. <laughs> Very nice. TikTok made Kirkland. What's that? TikTok kids made Kirkland cool. So oh, okay. All right. <laughs> uh, Perry Robinson. Price per ounce. Price per, okay. So when you go to the grocery store, you look at what the price per ounce is based on the size. So you can buy a larger size and the price per ounce is lower than it is for a smaller size container. Excellent, excellent point. And you know, one, one thing to consider now, now Perry I know happens to have three uh, young, well, teenage and young 20s daughters at home. So he's probably still mowing through food and stuff pretty fast. Like Wendy and I are empty nesters, so you know, for us to get the two gallon thing of mayonnaise at Costco, it's not ever gonna get done. We're gonna throw half, but although half the time, it's still cheaper to buy that, but we just don't have room in the fridge. But anyway, that's an excellent point. Tony. Along with two and three, don't go out to eat. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Okay, how often you go out to eat? And that is, uh, how, how about this, Tony? What if I say limit eating out? Okay, because, you know, as you can probably tell, what Bruce and I've been talking today, we're not saying you, you never have fun, but I, I guess it was Joby and, and both Granite when they were up here. Like, it was freeing to have a budget and go, oh, we can spend a hundred, two hundred, whatever a month on going out. And so then they didn't have to feel like, oh, we've already gone out three times this week. Can we go out again or you know, this month, whatever? So, but limit that absolutely. That's a that's a good point, Joby. Only pay for what you actually need. Um, like, actually just yesterday, Aaron came to me and said, hey, one month our internet bill goes up, 
And so we either pay more or we downgrade to less speed or whatever. Okay. And uh, I just did like a little one of those little speed tests right then and there, and I said we're not even getting out of it what we're paying, so let's just downgrade. You know? Okay. And then you need to pay for what you need. You know, okay, Joby brought up a really good thing. That how many people have like a gym membership, your Netflix account, your iCloud? You know, I, I have an iCloud thing. I don't even I don't even know if I ever used it. I think it's sucking ten dollars a month out of my I hate to admit it, but <laughs> You know, those things are so, and again, you younger guys got to be really careful with this because you, you sign up for a gym and if you're not watching your credit card bill, you know, three years later, you realize you're paying for a gym. Like maybe you go off to college somewhere and you're paying for a gym that's in South Dakota and, you know, or, or, or maybe it's local, but those kind of things really suck your life. Tony. Uh, with the uh, internet, about five years ago, we cut our cable. We didn't do cable, we just went straight data. If anybody's paying for cable, cut it. We didn't miss it for a day. Oh, I like it. <laughs> but Tony, aren't there such good moral shows you can see on TV? <laughs> your daughters would just be- You can give them the antenna and put them in your attic. Paragons of virtue. You know, mm -hmm. Tony- Save you a hundred bucks a month right there. I'm spelling cable right, okay. Yeah. I'm a horrible oh, speller. Yeah, right. you're right. The, um, yeah, Wendy and I have it. I mean, my son David in the back, I don't know if he remembers when, when he was little. We were we were dirt poor, and because like granite, Wendy and I made the decision that she wasn't going to work, and we never had cable. We did, we we could watch Disney videos when it was VHS. It was even before DVDs, and that that was it. That was it. We called child services. <laughs> <laughs> we were very deprived. Okay, uh, Candace. Weird one. Grocery planning. Ah, very good. Plan, plan meals. You're right. Don't just, don't just whatever looks good on the shelves. Plan your shopping, I guess, for, for groceries. One uh, hack we add to that is the um, grocery outlet. If you have one of those, it's like rotating stuff. But ah. we go there before the main grocery shopping because you never know what they'll have. And they had this like super fancy like sixty dollar olive oil for five bucks because someone was overstocked. <laughs> so you can get really great stuff for super cheap, but. We usually go there first. Gotcha. And okay. Because so, you don't know what they're going to have and not have a lot of times on basis. E excellent. Uh, let's see. Perry and then Jim. Don't buy a car more than uh, once every 10 years and don't lease a car. Okay. Okay. Very, very, very true that the, the, uh, make, make your car last and the, the, the pre, the, the last real car I had, I had it almost as long as Bruce. I think I had it for 13 years and had about 250,000 miles on it. So yeah, and, and uh, watch, watch, you know, a lease is probably normally not the right decision. Lynn Murray's car is 21 years old. <laughs> you can give another dollar. Okay, <laughs> Jen. see a, a, a store I guess I'll call that a store planning you know your 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 battle plan if you will and this ties in kind of Candace with what Candace said and I remember again I'm an engineer I'm a little bit weird but I remember at one point and, and Wendy and I were never impulse buyers however I mapped out our typical grocery list and I actually mapped it by the store so I, you know, would like, okay, I knew the ketchup and mustard were here, and then the eggs and milk were back here, and the cheese, you know. So I could just go down the list, and it made it very fast and efficient, and you don't do impulse buying, and, and that would work with what Jen's saying. It's like, okay, you know, the cereals from Walmart, and I know one thing I struggle with sometimes, like, you know, oh, God, I hate buying toothpaste at, at Rite Aid because it's a dollar more expensive than at Walmart. <laughs> Uh, let's see, Tony first and then back to Perry. Um, check your credit card bill because this happened to our oldest daughter. She loved to spend when she was young and then she would you know, not realize she signed up for something and then the next month and then a month and month after that. Like they just keep recurring charges and you don't go line by line. Then, and also your car insurance, you could be over-insuring uh, different things. You know. uh, recurring credit card. 
Yes, Tony, that is excellent, and I'm glad, Harry, we'll go to you in one second, but the, um, the over-insuring, okay? I never owned a new car till I was over 40 years old, and I had often had cars that were probably only worth a thousand or two thousand dollars. I would not put comp and collision on a two thousand dollar car. You do not need to pay for that. I've never been in an accident. It would just have been a waste of money, and your car is going to get totaled in a heartbeat. You know, if you barely get a fender bender, right? It's not worth paying for it. So I just, I just took a chance, and and then you obviously have to have liability coverage in case you crash into somebody else. Um, talking about over-insuring reminded me of this. This one might be a little tricky, but um, over-withholding. So some people give the, the government money interest-free, but it costs, for some but for some of us, that can function like a savings because then we get the refund and we're all happy. But it is possible to calculate closely how much taxes you're actually going to pay and then you have more, yeah. more cash on hand each month to yeah. use. That, I, I actually like that. And if, you know, this is one of those things, if you're disciplined, it sounds like Rudy is, if you're disciplined enough to, to actually map that out. You know, some people feel like, well, you know, I kind of like that it's a forced savings program. And here's one thing that's interesting. You know, for the last 10 years or so, interest rates were so low, you were making a quarter of a percent interest in the bank. I mean, right now, I'm getting like 4 and 5% interest on my checking account. Because, you know, since interest rates have gone up so much. So it can make a difference. You know, if you're, if you're holding on to several thousand dollars of your own money versus letting the government collect interest on it all, all year. I, I got to uh, throw a couple things in here. These are all great. But one of the things I want to mention, we're talking about shopping. We got off brands. We got eat out, plan shop, uh, store planning, recurring credit card. Now, all of the, the question is, how are you how are you paying for when you go out to eat? When the bill comes, how do you pay it? I would say if any of you have debt, you don't pay for that with a credit card. When you say recurring credit card, if you're in debt, you better take that credit card and cut it up if you want to really get honest. You need to get rid of the credit card. You, you, you need to get rid of the credit card. When Lynn Marie goes to the store, guess what? She pays cash. And you know what? You'll think twice about how you're spending money when it's cash as opposed to the card. You need to get rid of the credit card if you really want to get honest. So yeah, plan on where you're shopping, do it with cash. Unless you're out of debt, Jim. I hate to tell you that I, I okay, okay, I, I've been down there, I've been down there, and, and I, I will say that it is very easy to establish credit, but what happens is the vast majority of young people, when they get a credit card too early, you're right, they'll establish credit, they'll establish bad credit. So there's truth in what you're saying, but there's other ways you can do it, there really is, and it's not completely bogus what you're saying, but for most people, it's a bad thing. Colleen. I think a good rule of thumb is you can use your credit card if you know you can pay it off every month. There you go. Then and you're using and, their money. Yeah. And that's yes. time. Yeah. Look, I, I don't think we've ever not paid our credit. If you can't pay your credit card, actually, I would argue don't ever use a credit card. But there, there is a point Jen has to make. But if you can't pay it off every month, Definitely, Candace. Yeah. I'm piggybacking on hers. Get the credit card with the cash back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Harry, you've been patient. Go ahead. Just related to the shopping, so if you're comparing prices at different stores, use your phone to create a photo album yeah. of the things you usually buy at a given store. You can create multiple photo albums for each store. And then when you go to the next store, you're like, how much was the mayonnaise or the bread at that yeah. store for the same brand, the same item, you just pull it up on your phone, and then you know, okay, I don't buy that at this store, it's $1.50 more or whatever. So you, taking a picture with your phone and organizing those is really quick, and it's a really easy way to do price comparison. That way you don't have to write everything down. Okay, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna challenge everybody here, because a lot of this stuff, this stuff is helpful, but a lot of this stuff is kind of chopping at the leaves, not at the root. Because let's talk about some big ones, just, just for a couple minutes. So vacation. Because vacation can be 
$25,000 European vacation, or it can be what the Braun family did when our kids were little, taking a tent and going to Lake Arrowhead and having a tent and a Coleman stove, you know, a $150 tent that we that I still own 30 years later. And, uh, you know, and the kids, the truth is, the kids are gonna be a lot happier in the tent than going on a fancy vacation. Because that, that can be a huge swing. And then back to Bruce's four walls, you know, the car stuff, Harry touched on that about the car, because obviously that's a huge expense. The little stuff can add up, but make sure you don't fool yourself by Oh yeah, we're gonna do that. Well, I never went to Hawaii till or Europe till I was. I'd never been anywhere but Mexico or Canada till I was like forty some years old. <coughs> so, and I could have afforded it, I guarantee you. But we just chose to, you know, push some stuff off. So I was thinking, Park, has anybody here ever co-signed for anyone for a loan? Anybody? I have. You have? Yeah. You have? Anybody else ever co-signed for someone with a loan? Armin has. Tony has. Okay, I, I'm curious because this I, I have to. Um, did did you get stuck with it? They all paid back all, all those. Okay, did you get stuck with it? No. Good. Did you get stuck with it? No. no. Did you I, get I, stuck I, with it? I yep. kind of sort of did. You did. <laughs> you did? Yeah, I did. So the point is kind of fifty-fifty if you go sign for somebody with a loan who uh, who has shaky credit. So. Yeah, credit's a dangerous thing. Okay, we're gonna switch. We're gonna switch to careers for a minute because mem Bruce, remember, one of the yes. I have a quick question. When it went back to having your envelope with emergency, your envelope for the different things. And I know we're not we're not here to give too much financial advice, but let's just say that you have that already built up, and you have enough to pay off your. Is it wise to take a, a chunk away from what your monthly bills are if you have that opportunity to do so to have that feeling of not, you know, the car feeling better? Well, in other better. words, you're saying you have an emergency fund, you have money, mm -hmm. you have money in savings, mm -hmm. you owe on your car. I owe on my car. Do you owe on credit cards? I don't know. Okay. Um, my only real debt is that car. Then, then uh, and you have a car payment. I would pay the car, I can only tell you what I'd do. Mm -hmm. I would pay the car off cash, and I would take that payment and would start replenishing the account. <coughs> Keep making a payment to yourself. Okay, real quick, similar question. A lot of us have 3% uh, mortgages on our houses. Yeah. But in the banks, you know, our savings account can make 5%. So should you pay down your house or pay minimum payments and keep making that five percent in your bank account, Bruce. Can I, we, can, I would, we can do that later. Yeah, can we? Can we? That's a great yeah, question, Tony. It it's an important one, and it's probably a, a real one. Remember that when we're going to do Q and A in about twenty minutes, okay? Because uh -huh. we're we, we don't want to overrun too much here. Okay, so careers. Um, remember, remember what we said. There were there were two options in your budget. Remember what they were. Make more, make more or spend, spend less, less, right? So we just talked about saving, spend less. Okay, so to make more. Okay, so I told you careers were something that's kind of exciting to me because it's it's I see so many people just make kind of almost feeling random decision about how they end up doing whatever they do, and you need to. There, there's some things you can do that can make you make you more valuable. Now, one one thing that's important is. And, and this is something I'm also passionate about. Do not spend 200K on an education, no matter how much you love it, that is going to get you a $40,000 or $30,000 a year job. Okay? I, I'm sorry. You know, if, if you want to be a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, an accountant, whatever, you, maybe you need. I, I, didn't, I went to state schools, I went to Long Beach State. And I lived at home my first two years of college. Uh, I grew up and, and lived, went to UCSB for my first two years, and I transferred to Long Beach State. So I made an intentional choice. I didn't go to USC and blow 60 grand a year on tuition. And when I got out of school, I had no debt. Now, I know it's way more expensive now. College has outpaced other inflation. But do not buy into this ridiculous mindset. Find, go to a junior college for a few years, transfer, 
Do not go to some highfalutin school that is gonna get you a $40,000 a year job. Bad financial decision. Okay, um, an attitude that, that will make you more valuable, and I, I heard a, a guy at a retirement dinner give me this phrase, and I've, I've held on to it for 25 years. He said, make it happen, find a way. Okay, so in business, and, and this could be in a in a in a, uh, a nonprofit like like I would say Stella's kind of a make it happen find a way person, you know, you can call Stella and ask her to do something and she's not gonna well it's not my job I don't know. like she'll dig I don't and talk like that she'll, <laughs> make, it, make it happen find a way okay if if you have that attitude people will will want to employ you people will want to steal you from whatever, wherever you're working and have you come work for them. I mean, sometimes, I, I'm some, I, I've hit on people at, at Taco Bell before. Ew. Where, I, no, <laughs> Don't do that. no, if I, if, I see, if I see somebody who's just a hustler, has a great attitude, big smile, I mean, lunchtime at a fast food restaurant is DEF CON 5, right? Those guys are just hustling, working their tails off. And if I, if somebody like, and some, especially the guys that kind of remember you from, you know, week to week, like, oh, you know, you, you want water or you want this or that. And so I'm like, okay, that's the person I want working for me. So anyway, have that attitude. Somebody asks you to do something, even if it's out of your comfort zone or you're not quite sure what to do, can't go over, can't go under, can't go around, go through, you figure out, make it happen, find a way. Okay, um, anticipate needs. Again, this is a way that makes makes you more valuable. I chose to name my company Proactive Engineering. I heard so many clients when I worked for other people, you know, complain, well, my engineers, they don't, they don't think about what we're gonna need and they don't realize, you know, this road isn't gonna connect with this sewer and it's gonna be a problem. So anticipate, and along with that, I would say, oh, Bruce, by the way, I need you to do that handout for me, okay? So, <clears throat> The part of, part of what goes into that is, and, and I, I adopted this mindset, that the clients I work for, being in the, in the land development engineering business, it is not uncommon for somebody to spend 10, 50, 100 million dollars on a piece of dirt, right? I mean, that's what it is, it's dirt. And you spend 100 million dollars on a piece of dirt, and the interest clock, you know, okay, what's 10% of 100 million? It's 10 million. I mean, some, some projects we work on might be burning a million dollars a month in interest. A million dollars a month. So every month that Tony and I can't get plans approved and they can't start grading and putting the streets and sewer in the ground, it costs that guy a million dollars. So when, when they ask us to do something or when we run into a problem, we don't just, we don't just say, oh, um, here you go, here's some info. We try to, okay, why is he gonna need this? And if I was him, if I was the guy spending a hundred million dollars, what would I need to make the decision and what would influence my decision? So like, think it through. You don't, you don't just wanna you know, give somebody some random stuff. Like, try to think it through and package it in a way and even anticipate the questions maybe they don't, they're not thinking of. And the more you do that, the more value, valuable you become. So try to anticipate the needs, okay. Here's one that's gonna be a problem for a number of people in this room, okay? You gotta be humble, all right? And I know we got, we got some, some talented people, especially you younger people. You know, see, I was, I was like the last generation when that everybody didn't get a trophy, like, you know, when I was <laughs> I, playing football. You didn't get, you didn't get I trophies. I got no trophies. But you came, you were a Greek. That's why they didn't yeah, get any trophies, yeah. 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 No, I, I remember that it was a, I remember, you know, just, just like after I kind of went through junior high and high school, all of a sudden, like, everybody on soccer teams, like, was getting trophies, like, what, why, why does everybody get a trophy? So, you've all been told how special you are, you know, how, how unique, and you're just this wonderful person. Humility, humility goes so far, and just a, a, as a, speaking as a person who's an employer and a boss, when... Most, most good bosses want to mentor, and they, they love it when somebody wants to learn and wants to grow. 
and and you don't have to be the big boss. You can you can be a, a lower level person that maybe only has one person reporting to you. But if if the person is a sponge and wants to grow and learn, you, you like you most people love putting time into that person. And I'll give you a very specific example here that kind of goes with this. I would say scratch scratch this phrase, I know. Okay? Just don't don't say it. And, and let me give you an example. Okay? So say that say and this this happens a fair amount. You want me to do it? What's that? Well, it, it's it's okay. I I because I know. <laughs> yeah. Well done. Well done. So you know, maybe it might be something as just random as, as I'm serving at the altar with Deacon Rick, and he'll say, "Hey, we're doing a memorial after the service today." And if I already know it, you know what I don't say? Oh, I I know, I know. Because you know, it just it just has a little bit of irritating feeling to it, doesn't it? Like, oh, you know, you didn't need to tell me that. I'm I'm a smart guy, you, you know. So when when he says that, and I already know, I say, I either I either just nod, you know, obviously if we're serving, I don't say something loud, but, or I'll just go, you know, thanks. Like, dude, why do I have to say I know? It, it's irrelevant. It doesn't help him, and it doesn't help me. Just thank you. All right? So scratch those words. Be humble. Gotcha. That's what he says. When he says to you, gotcha, he, he decided not to say I know. When you're with him and he says gotcha, that's what it is. Right? That is, that is correct. That is correct. Okay. Show in the Perry, I know you're a teacher. I'm sure you would appreciate this. People that show care and attention to detail. Okay? That, that is so important. I, I, a funny story I like to tell. Before I started my own company, I, I was at a, a good-sized company, and the owner of the company had his son reporting to me for a while. He... Uh, so one, one time his son gave, I, he was doing a proposal and it, I think it was a Friday and he was in a rush to get out of the office and, and he gave me this half-baked proposal. So I just wrote on it, Ryan, the next time you give me something like this, please include your letter of resignation with it. And I put it back on his desk and he didn't do that to me again. So, you know, even if you're the boss's son, Show care, show attention to detail. People notice it. All of this stuff, all this stuff, you know, is, as I told you, it's making you more valuable. And how many people, how many people are feeling like, you know, right, right now, any services? Are you getting, do you feel like you're getting good service? No. Um, Ezra, you're, are you, you were working at El Pollo Loco. Are you still there? Yeah. Okay. He, he works just down the street from me, and there are times I will go to El Pollo Loco, and it's closed, you know, and it'll say, we couldn't have staff, um, you know, and then, and sometimes the drive throughs or the, or the walk-ins close, because it'll say, you know, sorry, not enough staffing, you have to just do the drive through that's, that's just logo. <laughs> that is, that is, you know, you know what, you know what, you're, you're not getting a 20, but I'll, I'll give you a 1. Okay, learn how to milk it. There you go. Okay, um, oh, I, I like this one. I, my personal opinion, you guys, the difference between between being average and outstanding, I believe, is about 10% of effort. Okay, you don't have to work twice as hard as everybody else to outshine them. You know, I, I look at my own path, and I don't ever claim to be the smartest person in the room, but I was usually willing to work harder than the person sitting next to me. And you know, it's that attitude. The it's the difference between when you know when you're at the DMV and it's it's uh, two minutes to noon, and the you know all of a sudden the person puts the sign up. You know, this window closed after you've been waiting for thirty minutes. It's like eh, it's my lunch time. I'm going. Like, you know, it, that attitude is only going to get you so far. And so just you know, I'm not saying you skip lunch every day, but you know, somebody once in a while somebody needs some help, and it's. Five minutes to five, and you end up staying till five thirty. You just do it. You just do it. 
and hopefully you're, you care enough about what you're doing that you actually enjoy it. Um, oh, I like this one. Okay. Be likable. Let's see. Brandon, show me a good smile. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So this, a, a smile goes a long, long way. Be likable. Because guess what? When, when you, people want to do business, whether as an employee or if you're in a sales position, they want to do business with people they like. You know, I think, Megan, you, you used to have to travel a lot for your job, right, at St. John Nitz. I bet you always had to put on the big smile and be friendly, right? I mean, you know, who wants to, who wants to buy stuff or, you know, co-work with somebody who's always, you know, looking, looking down and out? And along, along with this, here, I'll, I'll move up to the, I'll tell you what, I'll move, move up here so you don't have to look down. The, um, hold on, how was I going to say that? Be like a little smile. Uh, oh shoot, it just went in and out of my head. Okay. Oh, yeah, there, there it was. It goes along with that. that I, I, tell, I tell people, when, when somebody asks you, like at work or at a store or something, and they say, hey, they say, oh, you know, good morning, how you doing, whatever. And if, if you, if maybe you don't feel good, I mean, we got a lot of young parents in here, you know, Rudy, you got little girls everywhere, Grant, I, what are you up to, like eight kids or something now? You know, it's, a, well, and then Cameron's got teenagers, I mean, that's, you know, well, but you're basically perfect, Felina, right? So you're, you're the model, model child. But here's what's funny, when people ask you, uh, oh, how are you today? If, if you had a lousy night's sleep, maybe you don't feel good, do, do, you, do you think they really want to hear it? Do they really <laughs> want you to think, oh, oh, yeah, gosh, I hardly slept last night, you know, I just don't feel, because like, what are they supposed to do with that, right? Oh, I'm sorry, okay, and then uh, <laughs> walking on down. So, you know, I tell people, when, when people are you passing these out? Uh, no, the, okay. the, this one. All right, I already passed that. Okay, good. Okay. okay. Deacon? Okay, perfect. Deacon, yes. are you just talking about the workplace? Um, I would say, no, even in church. If you ask me if I'm, I walk into church, you say, how you feeling? I'll lie to you and say, hey, I'm feeling great. Don't do that. <laughs> no, yeah, I, mean, I mean, let's let's qualify, because Stella, hey, if, if, you know, if one of my kids just ended up in the hospital with emergency surgery, I would say something. But if, if it's just... You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge believer in, you know, the way you think about stuff is going to be reflected in, in how you act, okay? And, and how it, the whole thing works together. You know, if we, if we believe we're victims, we're going to go through life feeling victimized. But if you believe life is positive and that there's opportunity out there, you know, I think it's the whole difference between is the problem out there or do I have control of the problem? And if I, if I have more control of the problem, then it's something I can fix. But if, if I'm a victim, I can't fix it, right? So anyway, I don't want to over hit that, but just people, especially in the workplace, they really don't want to hear how bad it is, right? So you just, you just smile and keep I, going. I have to tell you guys yeah. that, that I think he's crazy, okay? However, Tony works for him, and I have seen this attitude that he has, which I've never met anyone quite like him, has proved incredibly successful for him in life. I'm not quite like that. I admire it, and it's worked really well for him. And all, I mean, his employees, they, they like him, you know. If he could just get Wendy to like him like his employees do, he'd be in really good shape. Give us a hug. <laughs> okay, just one or two quick other things. Really important is to think, think, Closure, okay? And what I mean by that is what does somebody, when somebody asks you to do something, I mean, and it can be, it can be Ezra working at El Pollo Loco. If you're cleaning the French fry vat or whatever, do a good job at it. Don't, don't, uh, what's the bare minimum so I can get out of here and go home and play video games, you know? Do a good job. Make it clean. You know, don't leave the counter a mess. So I interject real quick yeah. too. People will ask me. You know, they'll come to me and they'll say, "How can I get a raise?" Here's how you get a raise. 
You want to make yourself, Ezra, your mom, she was manager of pickup sticks restaurants. And Christy used to tell me about how petrified she would be if a certain employee was going to consider leaving. You want to make yourself so valuable to your employee that the nightmare for them is that you want to quit. If you all of a sudden make yourself valuable to your employer and he's an employer, he is more likely to give you a raise. Is that true? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. This, this is kind of a funny one, and we'll, we'll end with this, but don't follow your passions. There's a, there's a PragerView five-minute video that's called that, and it, he, he basically says, you know, don't, don't buy the Hollywood starlet thing of, you know, oh, don't ever let anybody tell you you can't do it. Like, <laughs> find, you know, how many people win American Idol? One. How many people try out for American Idol? Like, 100,000, okay? And there's 100,000 people that are probably never going to make a dime singing. So don't tell all those 199,000 people that they should follow their passion and try to be a singer because they're going to be broke and struggle. Okay, Bruce gave this handout. I'm not going to spend much time on it, but just there's a couple of quick things along with careers. Okay, this, and this is actually from 20 years ago. If you look in the lower right margin that's written sideways, it was from October 20th of 2003. And this thing, I, I saved this out of the Orange County Register because this guy, and, and the quote that's about two thirds of the way down a little bit under his picture, picture that I underlined, I just turned 31 and I make 50 to $60,000 a month. That's a great feeling. <laughs> Okay, and, I, and you see I, you know, in my chicken scratch writing here, you know, why not you? So again, especially for you younger folks, or for that matter, anybody in this room, why not you? Why, why do you have to settle for a $20 an hour job? Why, why? Who, is anybody holding a gun to your head that that's what you have to do? Now, if you love doing it, great. <coughs> but if, you know, I just, I just like people to aim high and, you know, Think a little bigger, and and uh, just just don't assume that you're you're gonna start out making peanuts, and, and that you're never gonna you're gonna get a four percent raise a year or something like that. Okay, um, Bruce, let's see where where's our next? Oh, here I, I, I hit it. Oh, okay, Bruce, real quick, do that first million handout also. Okay, what Bruce is gonna hand out? Bruce, I need one too. Mine disappeared on me. Uh, I think I think we do, okay. and some of the families can share them a little bit. Okay, just kind of circle back where we started, and I'm going to start reading this just briefly. It's it's a real quick read, but and this can this can apply to anybody in here. But it this this kind of gives a step by step of how easy it is to become a millionaire. And, and please, people, don't misunderstand me. I'm not hung up on being a millionaire. The point the point is. Make deliberate choices. Do not get sucked in to advertising. Do not get sucked in by the culture. We all know that is not going to bring us happiness, and that eighty-five thousand dollar car is going to be on the junk heap, you know, thirty years from now. Okay. So, but this this just you know a, a million dollars is kind of a number that we think about, and being a millionaire, it's common parlance in our culture. So I love what this guy came up with. So start on being making your first million at age 16. It's easier, easier than you think. Okay, so the, uh, he says you, um, da, 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 I'm going halfway down here. Okay, so he, to the, about two thirds way down the page, the fast food millionaire. So Ezra, this is for you working at El Pollo Loco. So let's, sh let's show you how four summer jobs can help you become, make your first million. You're 16 years old in high school, you're willing to work. Let's say you can clear about two grand over the course of the summer, okay? Now if only, and forget the thing about a grandparent, but let's just say you're, you make two grand, okay? You stick it in a Roth IRA, and it'll grow in a Roth tax-free for as long as you have the account. So basically what, what, and then if you flip to the second page, it says basically what you do is you, you do that for four summers in a row. So by the time you're, you're 20, You've, you've done $2,000 a summer for four years. That's $8,000. And at the top of that page, the second page, it's showing 
that you've, uh, you know, with compound interest, you maybe have about 9,400 bucks in, in the bank by the time you're 20. And then those bullets at the top of the page there, at age 30, you're gonna have 26 grand, at 40, 71 grand, at 50, almost 200, 60, about 550. And then by the time you're 67, it grows to 1.1 million. And he talks about the risk down below. He says, okay, he says, note that this plan does not require investment brilliance. It does not, it only depends on two things. You start early and you be tenacious. If you invested in small company stocks that return 12 and a half percent in, and he's basing this on what, you know, historic norms, like, so he's saying, you know, uh, certain stocks have done 12 and a half percent, it would actually grow to more than the million to be 2.4 million. But he ran this, this was based on about a 10% a year return. And I love his last two or three paragraphs. He says, the yes, but crew are happy to tell you that a million dollars isn't what it used to be. I can remember people telling me this in the 60s, but it's true now as ever. Um, it's having a million dollars is still a nice number to have. And, he, and uh, the very last paragraph, he says, well, you know, people, well, you don't know what the future's gonna bring. You know what, that is true. We don't know what the future's gonna bring. You know, Bruce brought up, that, okay, we had COVID hit us all. None of us saw that coming. There was the big financial meltdown in 2008. And, Stuff's gonna happen, but you'd rather be prepared than not. And you, 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 you know, as we said, you don't want to bury your head in the sand or or do the well. I'm just gonna trust God. You know, we've all heard that the classic, you know, where the the flood and the boat and you know nobody the the boat the helicopter nobody takes questions. Okay, questions. All right. So with that, let's stop and uh, turn it over. Questions. To questions. Any, we just have a few minutes. We're just about done. Questions. People. Tony's question. Tony. Yeah, you have 3% mortgage, and uh, your bank's uh, giving you a 5% just in your checking account. What do you do? You, your, your bank is, you have a 3% mortgage, okay? But you can get better percentage rate in a mutual fund or in a savings. Do you pay off your house, or do you just make minimum payments and let that thing stretch on for the next 30 years? I, I do believe in, that I can only tell you what I would do, okay? I am a complete believer in no matter what, paying off debt. The, the, when Lynn Marie and I paid off the house, again, when we paid off the mortgage here, it, the ground felt different underneath our feet. Uh, every situation's different. I can only tell you what I would do. I always say pay off debt. That's, oh, that's oh, me. One second, Craig. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to be point counterpoint. Yeah. Okay. Th this is one of the rare things that Bruce and I are not in complete in harmony on. And now, I have no debt. I never carry a balance on a credit card, um, cars. So um, I, I do carry debt on my home because I have a 2.5% interest rate. And I, so I'm okay with that debt. So the caveat I would give to what Bruce said, and I don't, it's not a bad idea to pay off your house, and there, and, and there is the emotional you know, thing of how this is paid for, and if the economy goes to heck, I'm, I don't have to worry about a house payment. There is something to be said for that. Um, but if you're, if you're in a fairly aggressive person in saving and investing, I'm comfortable with not yeah, paying off and, the house. And, and again, the caveat to that, look, if I was him, okay, with his, in, if you saw his income and my income, you wouldn't believe the disparity between his income and my income. I don't make much money anymore. I'm generally retired, okay? So if I was him, I'd probably have that attitude, okay? Now, to tell you the truth, even though our incomes are different, our lifestyles are, are the same. We travel the same kind of vacations, do the same kind of things. We've approached it differently. So again, I get what he's saying, but if you're asking me, yeah. I don't know your complete financial situation. Terry, I have a Just to piggyback, something to consider is decade by decade, real estate depreciates 13%, mm -hmm. which generally outperforms the stock market. Your, your home will appreciate over time the sooner you pay it off, and you're in a position to sell later on, you're gonna probably make more money on that than you would your contributions to your stock market. It depends on what you're investing in, of course, and all kinds of other factors. But real estate is a really good investment overall, over time compared to other forms, uh, forms of ownership like stocks. 
So there's something to, to consider. You know, you know what, guys? Just I'll take just a. I'll try to keep this to one minute. Bruce, slide to the side. The, 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 there, I get this question a lot about: Is it better to buy real estate or stock? Okay, now stay with me. There's a little math here, but I'll try to keep this simple. Let's let's just say we'll, we'll keep it really simple. Let's just say that you 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 put a hundred thousand dollars into stock, and you put a hundred thousand dollars into a house. Okay. So here's, here's what's kind of interesting, the way this works. So with $100,000, let's say, what, what, if you put $100,000 down on a house, you can probably buy a house worth 500 k right? 20% down, okay? So let's say this buys a 500 k house. Now, if you buy $100,000 worth of stock, of Apple stock or whatever, you're getting $100,000 worth of Apple stock, okay? Now, if, if Apple stock goes up 10%, how much have you made? Ten grand. You made ten grand. Okay, so and so you've made a ten percent return on your hundred thousand dollar investment. Okay, now if your house goes up ten percent, how much did you make? Fifty. You made fifty. So on your hundred thousand dollar investment, you made fifty thousand dollars. So you actually made fifty percent instead of ten percent. So this is this is what you call leverage. Because you're you you leverage you borrowed more you, you borrowed money more than you put down. and it depends on your place in the world. Look, if you decided you looked at these two scenarios and you decided I'm going to buy real estate and guess what the year is 2007. Right. You ate it. You, you bought high and okay. now you decided. wouldn't eat it big time if you're really an investor. If you decided I was investing, I'm staying in long term. You'll be fine long term, but short term, and it's even like this in the stock market. You know, people will buy stock and they'll all of a sudden it'll go down and oh, it's not worth. Look, I have stocks right now. Colleen and I talk about this. In fact, Joby, Colleen, and I have a same stock that we talk about, and this stock has actually gone down in value. We've all commiserated about it. However, we're getting a dividend that we're happy with and we are looking at it long term. So you've got to look at invest, you've got to decide whether you're an investor or a speculator. So yeah. there's a difference. Spencer. Quick question, someone like me who's 51, yeah. who went through the housing market, yeah. lost everything. Yeah, okay. exactly. there you go. <clears throat> My goal is to end up buying a piece of property, even if it's in Arizona and I rent it out or mm -hmm. something. Should my goals be stocks? Because I mean, I, I, I had to take all my 401k out and everything. I'm down to seven bucks. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing is, too much. What would someone at my age, who's basically starting over, should I focus more on attaining a home somewhere or stocks and a mutual fund for my retirement? You're not going to get us to give you financial advice. Now, if you ever want, especially like, like I don't. I mean, here's what I tell you. Whatever I tell you to do, do the opposite. opposite. Okay. Okay. No, I don't, I don't like giving funding. My buddy, look, my buddy Mark Johnson, who I did, when I started at the beginning, said to me, what do you want? We can talk privately, and I need to know more about your situation, but again, regularly ask yourself that question. What do you want? Lynn Marie and I, at this point in our life, we have a lot of money in the stock market, okay? We, I don't care what my stock market portfolio is worth. Colleen knows what I'm going to say here. I look at, I have dividends. That's what I live on, is my dividend. My portfolio goes up, it goes down. In the last month, my portfolio went up 100,000. Now it's down 100,000. I don't really care. I live for my dividend, okay? I'm 69 years old, okay? I'm in a different place of life than you. So that doesn't mean you should do what I do. Everybody's situation is different. And, I, you know, so we could talk privately, but I wouldn't want that to to be considered for other people, so. Okay, I appreciate yep. that. Thank you. Anybody else before we end? I'm expecting some of the young people have to ask a question. Nobody's getting out of here for free. <laughs> maybe Anybody? something that we can do as a church for young people, maybe do a side business, something that we can sell something online and that way they can work together and learn basically the ups and downs, the reality of maybe this thing stunk. Let's try making something nice or what But well, that'd be cool as a church, maybe. To... Very, yeah, nice. You know what, just to Spencer's question, I'll, I'll address it in a little roundabout way. 
you know, because because the scenario Spencer spelled out, what happened to him is why we are meeting today to try to avoid. Yeah. And yeah. and because Spencer, for whatever reason, I don't know the hows and whys, he got into a point where he had to sell mm -hmm. his house, or or hand the keys back. I don't know what you did. Sale. Okay, short sale, and he had to cash out his four hundred one k or whatever. So. And, and I don't know, Spencer might have been the most careful person in the world. You know, sometimes you're just in the wrong place at the wrong time. You know, I mean, if, if you, you happen to live in Europe in, you know, 1935 when the war broke out, you know, you were just in the wrong place at the wrong time, right? Um, it didn't matter how responsible you were or weren't. But to the best of our ability, we want to make careful decisions. You know, like the Bible tells us, you know, build your house on the rock, not on the sand. Count the cost of the tower before you build it. You don't want to have the tower half built. And so, you know, I, I, in general, I would say save money, put it in a fairly safe investment, although younger people, frankly, can afford more risk. You know, Bruce is doing dividends. I wouldn't want to see these young folks putting all their stuff in Agreed. dividend stocks. Agreed. You know, because they can afford the market to fluctuate and they can look at a 40 year horizon. Yeah. Bruce, you know, yeah, Bruce will be lucky to be alive in four years, let alone. <laughs> so, anyway. He I, quoted scripture. I have a scripture to quote out of Proverbs because my whole thing's been about debt. Proverbs says the borrower is slave to the lender. Slave to the lender. Are you enslaved in debt? Don't be enslaved anymore. Control your passions, your passions to spend. You know, you may look at investing. The biggest investment you could do at the beginning is just to get out of debt. You can do that. Everything's going to feel different. Yes, yes. And, and the last thing I would say that kind of ties in with the Spencer comment for everybody, especially the young people, just save some, find a good uh, middle-of-the-road mutual fund like a S&P 500 and just... You, you can a lot of them you can open up with as little as a thousand dollars. Some have like twenty five hundred, five thousand minimum, and just start putting money in there. And just every time you know, get in the habit of putting money in there, and it'll be amazing. Again, feel free to talk to Armin if you want to find out about YNAB. Feel free to ask me questions or Deacon Tom. But if you want to close us, sure. Any 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 last question? That's great. This this is it. Okay. All right. Well, let's let's uh, end in prayer. But thank you guys for coming out. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's stand and pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Lord, we look for your guidance in all that we say and do, and especially with the money you choose to give us. Help us to be good stewards. Help us to be kind and generous to those around us in need. We do ask that you bless us that we can do that. In your blessed name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.